The King in Yellow, Robert W. Chambers, 1895. I'm Jonathan Ingwall. The King in Yellow is dedicated to my brother. Along the shore, the cloud waves break, the twin suns sink beneath the lake, the shadows lengthen in Carcosa. Strange is the night where black stars rise and strange moons circle through the skies, but stranger still is lost Carcosa. Songs that the Hyades shall sing, for flap the tatters of the king, must die unheard in dim Carcosa. Song of my soul, my voice is dead. Die thou unsung as tears unshed shall dry and die in lost Carcosa. Casilda's Song in the King in Yellow, Act 1, Scene 2. The Repairer of Reputations, 1. The Raylan's Passless Fools, Le Foule du Plots Long Temps Que Le Note, Voilà toute la différence. <clears throat> Toward the end of the year 1920, the government of the United States had practically completed the program adopted during the last months of President Winthrop's administration. The country was apparently tranquil. Everybody knows how the tariff and labor questions were settled, the war with Germany incident and that country's seizure of the Samoan Islands had left no visible scars upon the Republic, and the temporary occupation of Norfolk by the invading army had been forgotten in the joy over repeated naval victories and the subsequent ridiculous plight of General von Gardenlaub's forces in the state of New Jersey. The Cuban and Hawaiian investments had paid 100%, uh, and the territory of Samoa was well worth its cost as a coaling station. The country was in a superb state of defense. Every coast city had been well supplied with land fortifications. The army, under the parental eye of the general staff, organized according to the Prussian system, had been increased to 300,000 men with a territorial reserve of a million, and six magnificent squadrons of cruisers and battleships patrolled the six stations of the navigable seas, leaving a steam reserve amply fitted to control home waters. The gentlemen from the West had at last been constrained to acknowledge that a college for the training of diplomats was as necessary as a law school for the training of bar barristers. Consequently, we were no longer represented abroad by incompetent patriots. The nation was prosperous. Chicago, for a moment paralyzed after second great fire, had risen from its ruins white and imperial and more beautiful than the white city which had been built for its plaything in 1893. Everywhere good architecture was replacing bad, and even in New York, a sudden craving for decency had swept away a great portion of the existing horrors. Streets had been widened, properly paved and lighted, trees had been planted, squares laid out, elevated structures demolished, and underground roads built to replace them. The new government buildings and barracks were fine bits of architecture, and the long system of stone quays which completely surrounded the island had been turned into parks which proved the godsend to the population. The subsidizing of the state theater and state opera bought, brought its own reward. The United States Naval Academy of Design was much like European institutions of the same kind. Nobody envied the Secretary of Fine Arts, either his cabinet position or his portfolio. The Secretary of Forestry and Game Preservation had a much easier time thanks to the new system of National Mounted Police. We had profited by the latest treaties with France and England, the exclusion of foreign-born Jews as a measure of self-preservation, the settlement of the new independent Negro state of Swanee, the checking of immigration and the new laws concerning naturalization and the gradual centralization of power in the executive all contributed to national calm and prosperity. When the government solved the Indian problem and squadrons of Indian cavalry scouts in native costume were substituted for the pitiful organizations tacked on to the tail of skeletonized regiments by a former secretary of war, the nation drew a long sigh of relief when, 
After the colossal congress of religions, bigotry and intolerance were laid in their graves, and kindness and charity began to draw warring sects together. Many thought the millennium had arrived, at least in the new world, which, after all, is a world by itself. But self-preservation is the first law, and the United States had to look on in helpless sorrow as Germany, Italy, Spain, and Belgium writhed in the throes of anarchy, while Russia, watching from the Caucasus, stooped and bound them one by one. In the city of New York, the summer of 1899 was signalized by the dismantling of the elevated railroads. The summer of 1900 will live in the memories of New Yorkers for many a cycle. The Dodge statue was removed in that year. In the following winter began the agitation for the repeal of the laws prohibiting suicide, which bore its final fruit in the month of April 1920, when the first government lethal chamber was opened on Washington Square. I'd walked down that day from Dr. Archer's house on Madison Avenue, where I had been as a mere formality, Ever since that fall from my horse four years before, I had been troubled at times with pains in the back of my head and neck, but now for months I had been absent, and the doctor sent me away that day, saying there was nothing more to be cured in me. It was hardly worth his fee to be told that I knew it myself. Still, I did not grudge him the money. What I minded was the mistake which he had made at first. When they picked me up from the pavement where I lay unconscious, and somebody had mercifully sent the bullet through my horse's head, I was carried to Dr. Archer, and he, pronouncing my brain affected, placed me in his private asylum, where I was obliged to endure treatment for insanity. At last he decided that I was well, and I, knowing that my mind had always been as sound as his, if not sounder, paid my tuition, as he jokingly called it, and left. I told him, smiling, that I would get even with him for his mistake, and he laughed heartily, and asked me to call once in a while. I did so hoping for a chance to even up accounts, but he gave me none, and I told him I would wait. The fall from my horse had fortunately left no evil results. On the contrary, it had changed my whole character for the better. From a lazy young man about town, I had become active, energetic, temperate, and above all, oh, above all else, ambitious. There was only one thing which troubled me. I laughed at my own uneasiness, and yet it troubled me. During my convalescence, I had bought and read for the first time The King in Yellow. I remember after finishing the first act that it occurred to me that I had better stop. I started up and flung the book into the fireplace. The volume struck the barred gate and fell open on the hearth in the firelight. If I had not caught a glimpse of the opening words in the second act, I should never have finished it. But as I stooped to pick it up, my eyes became riveted to the open page, and with a cry of terror, or perhaps it was a joy so poignant that I suffered in every nerve, I snatched the thing out of the coals and crept shaking to my bedroom, where I read it and reread it, and wept and laughed and trembled with a horror which at times assails me yet. This is the thing that troubles me, for I cannot forget Carcosa, where black stars hang in the heavens, where the shadows of men's thoughts lengthen in the afternoon where the twin suns sink into the lake of holly and my mind will bear forever the memory of the pallid mask i pray god will curse the writer as the writer has cursed the world with this beautiful stupendous creation terrible in its simplicity irresistible in its truth a world which now trembles before the king in yellow when the French government seized the translated copies, which had just arrived in Paris, London, of course, became eager to read it. It is well known how the book spread, like an infectious disease, from city to city, from continent to continent, barred out here, confiscated there, denounced by press and pulpit, censured even by the most advanced of literary anarchists. Though definite principles had been violated in those wicked pages, no doctrine promulgated, no convictions outraged. It could not be judged by any known standard. Yet, although it was acknowledged that the supreme note of art had been struck in the king in yellow, all felt that human nature could not bear the strain nor thrive on words in which the essence of pure poison lurked. The very banality and innocence of the first act only allowed the blow to fall afterward with more awful effect. It was, I remember, the 13th day of April, 1920, 
that the first government lethal chamber was established on the south side of Washington Square between Wooster Street and South Fifth Avenue. The block, which had formerly consisted of a lot of shabby old buildings used as cafes and restaurants for foreigners, had been acquired by the government in the winter of 1898. The French and Italian cafes and restaurants were torn down. The whole block was enclosed by a gilded iron railing and converted into a lovely garden with lawns, flowers, and fountains. In the center of the garden stood a small white building, severely classical in architecture and surrounded by thickets of flower. Six ionic columns supported the roof, and the single door was of bronze. A splendid marble group of the fates stood before the door, the work of a young American sculptor, Boris Yvain, who had died in Paris when only 23 years old. The inauguration ceremonies were in progress as I crossed University Place and entered the square. I threaded my way through the silent throng of spectators, but was stopped at 4th Street by cordon of police. A regiment of the United States Lancers were drawn up in a hollow square around the lethal chamber. On a raised tribune facing Washington Parks to the governor of New York, and behind him were the group, the mayor of New York and Brooklyn, the inspector general of the police, Commandant of the State Troops, Colonel Livingston, military aide to the President of the United States, General Blount, commanding at Governor's Island, Major General Hamilton, commanding the garrison of New York and Brooklyn, Admiral Buffy of the fleet in the North River, Surgeon General Lacefort, the staff of the National Free Hospital, Senators Wise and Franklin of New York, and the Commissioner of Public Works. The Tribune was surrounded by a squadron of hussars of the National Guard. The government was finishing the governor was finishing his reply to the short speech of the Surgeon General. I heard him say the laws prohibiting suicide and providing punishment for any attempt at self destruction have been repealed. The government has seen fit to acknowledge the right of man to end an existence which may have become intolerable to him through physical suffering or mental despair. It is believed that the community will be benefited by the removal of such people from their midst. Since the passage of this law, the number of suicides in the United States has not increased. Now the government has determined to establish a lethal chamber in every city, town, and village in the country. It remains to be seen whether or not that class of human creatures, from whose desponding ranks new victims and self-destruction fall daily, will accept the relief thus provided. He paused and turned to the white lethal chamber. The silence of the street was absolute. There a painless death awaits him who can no longer bear the sorrows of this life. If death is welcome, let him seek it there. Then, quickly turning to the military aide of the president's household, he said, I declare the lethal, lethal chamber open. And again, facing the vast crowd, he cried in a clear voice, Citizens of New York and of the United States of America, through me the government declares the lethal chamber to be open. The solemn hush was broken by a sharp cry of command. The squadron of hussars filed after the governor's carriage. The lancers wheeled and formed along Fifth Avenue to wait for the commandant, the garrison, and the mounted police followed them. I left the crowd to gape and stare at the white marble death chamber and crossing South Fifth Avenue, walked along the western side to that thoroughfare to Bleecker Street. Then I turned to the right and stopped before a dingy shop which bore the sign, Halbert, Armor. I glanced in at the doorway and saw Halbert busy in his little shop at the end of the hall. He looked up and, catching sight of me, cried in his deep, hearty voice, Come in, Mr. Castigain. Constance, his daughter, rose to me as I crossed the threshold and held out her pretty hand, but I saw the blush of disappointment on her cheeks and knew that it was another cast again she had expected, my cousin Louis. I smiled at her confusion and complimented her on the banner she was embroidering from a colored plate. Old Halbert sat riveting the worn greaves of some ancient suit of armor, and the ting, ting, ting of his little hammer sounded pleasantly in the quaint shop. Presently he dropped his hammer and fussed about for a moment with a tiny wrench. The soft clash of the mail sent a thrill of pleasure through me. I loved to hear the music of steel brushing against steel, the mellow shock of the mallet on thigh pieces and the jingle of chain armor. That was the only reason I went to see Halbert. 
He had never interested me personally, nor did Constance, except for the fact of her being in love with, with Louis. This did occupy my attention, and sometimes even kept me awake at night. But I knew in my heart that all would come right, and that I should arrange their future as I expected to arrange that of my kind doctor, John Archer. However, I should never have troubled myself about visiting them just then, had it not been, as I say, that the music of the tinkling hammer had for me this strong fascination. I would sit for hours, listening and listening, when a stray sunbeam struck the inlaid steel. The sensation it gave me was almost too keen to endure. My eyes would become fixed, dilated with a pleasure that stretched every nerve almost to breaking until some movement of the old armor cut off the ray of sunlight then still thrilling secretly i leaned back and listened again to the sound of the polishing rag swish swish rubbing rust from the rivets constance worked with the embroidery over her knees now and then pausing to examine more closely the pattern in the colored plate in the metropolitan museum who is this for i asked Hauberk explained that in addition to the treasures of armor in the Metropolitan Museum, of which he had been appointed armor, he also had charge of several collections belonging to rich amateurs. This was the missing grieve of the famous suit which a client of his had traced to a little shop in Paris on the Quai d'Arsay. He, Hauberk, had negotiated for and secured that grieve, and now the suit was complete. He laid down his hammer and read me the history of the suit traced since 1450 from owner to owner until it was acquired by Thomas Stainbridge. When his superb collection was sold, this client of Halbert's bought the suit, and since then the search for the missing grief had been pushed until it was, almost by accident, located in Paris. Did you continue the search so persistently without any certainty of the grief being still in existence? I demanded. Of course, he replied coolly. Then, for the first time, I took a personal interest in Halbert. It was worth something to you, then, I ventured. No, he replied, laughing. My pleasure in finding it was my reward. Have you no ambition to be rich? I asked, smiling. My one ambition is to be the best armorer in the world, he answered gravely. Constance asked me if I had seen the ceremonies at the lethal chamber. She herself had noticed cavalry passing up Broadway that morning and had wished to see the inauguration, but her father wanted the banner finished, and she had stayed at his request. Did you see your cousin, Mr. Castigain, there? she asked with the slightest tremor of her soft eyelashes. No, I replied. Louis's regiment is maneuvering out in Westchester County. I rose and picked up my hat and cane. Are you going upstairs to see the lunatic again? laughed old Hauberk. If Hauberk knew how much I loathed that word lunatic, he would never use it in my presence. It roused certain feelings within me which I did not care to explain. However, I answered him quickly, I think I shall drop in and see Mr. Wilde for a moment or two. Poor fellow, said Constance, with a shake of her head. It must be hard to live alone year after year, poor, crippled, and almost demented. It is very good of you, Mr. Castigain, to visit him as often as you do. I think he is vicious, observed Hauberk, beginning again with his hammer. I listened to the golden tinkle on the grieved plates. When he had finished, I replied, No, he is not vicious, nor is he in the least demented. His mind is a wonder chamber from which he can extract treasures that you and I would give years of our life to acquire. Hauberk laughed. I continued a little impatiently. He knows history as no one else could know it. Nothing, however trivial, escapes his search, and his memory is so absolute, so precise in details, that were it known in New York that such a man existed, the people would not honor him enough. Nonsense, muttered Halbert, searching on the floor for a fallen rivet. Is it nonsense, I asked, managing to suppress what I felt, is it nonsense when he says that the tacits and cussards of the enameled suit of armor commonly known as the Prince's Emblazon, can be found among a mass of rusty theatrical properties, broken stoves and rag pickers' refuges, in the garret in Pell Street. Halbert's hammer fell to the ground, but he picked it up and asked, with a great deal of calm, how I knew that the tacits and left kissard were missing from the Prince's Emblazon. 
I did not know until Mr. Wilde mentioned it to me the other day. He said they were in the garret of 998 Pell Street. Nonsense, he cried, but I noticed his hand trembling under his leathern apron. Is this nonsense too? I asked pleasantly. Is it nonsense when Mr. Wilde continually speaks of you as the Marquis of Avonshire and of Miss Constance? I did not finish, for Constance had started to her feet, with terror written on every feature. Hubbard looked at me and slowly smoothed his leathern apron. That is impossible, he observed. Mr. Wilde may know a great many things about armor, for instance, and the princes emblazoned, I interposed, smiling. Yes, he continued slowly, about armor also, maybe, but he is wrong in regard to the Marquis of Avonshire, who, as you know, killed his wife's traducer years ago and went to Australia, where he did not long survive his wife. Mr. Wilde is wrong, murmured Constance. Her lips were blanched, but her voice was sweet and calm. Let us agree, if you please, that in this one circumstance, Mr. Wilde is wrong, I said. 2. I climbed the dilapidated flights of stairs, which I had so often climbed before, and knocked at a small door at the end of the corridor. Mr. Wilde opened the door, and I walked in. When he had double-locked the door and pushed a heavy chest against it, he came and sat down beside me, and peering up into my face with his little light-colored eyes, half a dozen new scratches covered his nose and cheeks, and silver wires, which supported his artificial ears, had be become displaced. I thought I had never seen him so hideously fascinating. He had no ears. The artificial ones, which now stood out at an angle from the fine wire, were his one weakness. They were made of wax and painted a shell pink, but the rest of his face was yellow. He might have better reveled in the luxury of some artificial fingers for his left hand, which was absolutely fingerless, but it seemed to cause him no inconvenience, and he was satisfied with his wax ears. He was very small, scarcely higher than a child of ten, but his arms were magnificently developed, and his thighs as thick as any athlete's. Still, the remarkable thing about Mr. Wilde was that a man of his marvelous intelligence and knowledge should have such a head. It was flat and pointed like the heads of many of those unfortunate whom people in prison and asylums for the weak-minded. Many called him insane, but I knew him to be as sane as I was. I do not deny that he was eccentric. The mania he had for keeping that cat and teasing her until she flew at his face like a demon was certainly eccentric. I never could understand why he kept the creature nor what pleasure he found in shutting himself up in his room with this, this surly, vicious beast. I remember once, glancing up from the manuscript I was studying by the light of some tallow dips, and seeing Mr. Wilde squatting, motionless, on his high chair, his eyes fairly blazing with excitement, while the cat, which had risen from her place before the stove, came creeping across the floor, right at him. Before I could move, she flattened her belly to the ground, crouched, trembled, and sprang to his face. Howling and foaming, they rolled over and over on the floor, scratching and crawling, until the cat screamed and fled under the cabinet. Mr. Wilde turned over on his back, his limbs contracting and curling up like the legs of a dying spider. He was eccentric. Mr. Wilde had climbed into his high chair, and, after studying my face, picked up a dog's dog Zeered ledger and opened it. Henry B. Matthews, he read, bookkeeper with Wysot, Wysot and Company, dealers in church ornaments, called April 3rd, reputation damaged on the racetrack, known as a welcher, reputation to be repaired by August 1, retainer $5. He turned the page and ran his fingerless knuckles down the closely written columns. P. Green Dusenberry, Minister of the Gospel, Fair Beach, New Jersey, reputation damaged in the Bowery, to be repaired as soon as possible. Retainer, one hundred dollars, he coughed and added, called April 6th. Then you are not in need of money, Mr. Wilde, I inquired. Listen, he coughed again, Mrs. C. Hamilton Chester of Chester Park, New York City, called April 7th. Reputation damaged at deep, France, to be repaired by October 1st, retainer 
hundred dollars. Note, C. Hamilton Chester, Captain USS Avalanche, ordered home from South Sea Squadron, October 1st. Well, I said, the profession of a repairer of reputations is lucrative. His coverless eyes sought mine. I only want to demonstrate that I was correct. You said it was impossible to succeed as a repairer of reputations, that even if I did succeed in certain cases it would cost me more than I would gain by it. Today I have 500 men in my employ who are poorly paid but who pursue the work with an enthusiasm which possibly may be born of fear. These men enter every shade and grade of society. Some even are pillars of the most exclusive social temples. Others are the prop and pride of the financial world. Still others hold undisputed sway among the fancy and the talent. I choose them at my leisure from those who reply to my advertisements. It is easy enough. They are all cowards. I could treble the number in twenty days if I wished. So you see, those who have in their keeping the reputations of their fellow citizens, I have in my pay. They may turn on you, I suggested. He rubbed his nose and his thumb over his cropped ears and adjusted the wax substitutes. I think not, he murmured thoughtfully. I seldom have to apply the whip and then only once. Besides, they like their wages. How do you apply the whip, I demanded. His face for a moment was awful to look upon. His eyes dwindled to a pair of green sparks. I invite them to come and have a little chat with me, he said in a soft voice. A knock at the door interrupted him. and His face resumed its amiable expression. Who is it? he inquired. Mr. Stillett was the answer. Come tomorrow, replied Mr. Wilde. Impossible, began the other, but was silenced by a sort of bark from Mr. Wilde. Come tomorrow, he repeated. We heard somebody move away from the door and turn the corner by the stairway. Who is that? I asked. Arnold Stalet, owner and editor-in-chief of the great New York Daily. He drummed on the ledger with his fingerless hand, adding, I pay him very badly, but he thinks it is a good bargain. Arnold Stalet. I repeated, amazed. Yes, said Mr. Wilde with a self-satisfied cough. The cat, which had entered the room as he spoke, hesitated, looked up at him and snarled. He climbed down from the chair and, squatting on the floor, took the creature into his arms and caressed her. The cat ceased snarling and presently began a loud purring, which seemed to increase in timbre as he stroked her. Where are the notes? I asked. He pointed to the table, and for the hundredth time, I picked up the bundle of manuscripts entitled The Imperial Dynasty of America. One by one I studied the well-worn pages, worn only by my own handling, and although I knew all by heart from the beginning, when from Carcosa, the Hades, Hoster, and Aldebaran, to Castigain, Louis de Calvados, born December 19, 1877, I read it with an eager, rapt attention, pausing to repeat parts of it aloud and dwelling especially on Hildred de Calvados, only son of Hildred Castigain and Edith Lands Castigain, first in succession, etc., etc. When I finished, Mr. Wilde nodded and coughed. Speaking of your legitimate ambition, he said, how do Constance and Louis get along? She loves him, I replied simply. The cat on his knee suddenly turned and struck at his eyes, and he flung her off and climbed onto the chair opposite me. And Dr. Archer, but that's a matter. You can saddle at any time you wish, he answered. Yes, I replied, Dr. Archer can wait, but it is time I saw my cousin Louis. It is time, he repeated. Then he took another ledger from the table and ran over the leaves rapidly. We are now in communication with ten thousand men, he muttered. We can count on 100,000 within the first 28 hours, and in 48 hours the state will rise en masse. The country follows the state, and the portion that will not, I mean California and the Northwest, might better never have been inhabited. I shall not send them the yellow sign. The blood rushed to my head, but I only answered. A new broom sweeps clean. 
The ambition of Caesar and of Napoleon paled before that which could not rest until it had seized the minds of men and controlled even their unborn thoughts, said Mr. Wilde. You are speaking of the king in yellow, I groaned with a shudder. He is a king whom emperors have served. I am content to serve him, I replied. Mr. Wilde sat rubbing his ears with his crippled hand. Perhaps Constance does not love him, he suggested. I started to reply, but a sudden burst of military music from the street below drowned my voice. The 20th Dragoon Regiment, formerly in garrison at Mount St. Vincent, was returning from the maneuvers in Westchester County to its new barracks on East Washington Square. It was my cousin's regiment. They were a fine lot of fellows in their pale blue tight-fitting jackets, jaunty busbies and white riding breeches with the double yellow stripe into which their limbs seemed molded. Every other squadron was armed with lances, from the metal points of which fluttered yellow and white pennons. The band passed, playing the regimental march. Then came the colonel and staff, the horses crowding and trampling, while the heads bobbed in unison and the pennons fluttered from their lance points. The troopers who rode with the beautiful English seat looked brown as berries from their bloodless campaigns among the farms of Westchester, and the music of their sabers against the stirrups, and the jingle of spur and carbines was delightful to me. I saw Louis riding with the squadron. He was as handsome an officer as I have ever seen. Mr. Wilde, who had mounted a chair by the window, saw him too, but said nothing. Louis turned and looked straight at Hauberk's shop. As he passed, I could see the flush in his brown cheeks. I think Constance must have been at the window. When the last troopers had clattered by and the last pennants vanished into South Fifth Avenue, Mr. Wilde clambered out of his chair and dragged the chest away from the door. Yes, he said, it is time that you saw your cousin Louis. He unlocked the door, and I picked up my hat and stick and stepped into the corridor. The stairs were dark. Groping about, I set my foot on something soft, which snarled and spit. I aimed a murderous blow at the cap, but my cane shivered to splinters against the balustrade, and the beast scurried back to Mr. Wilde's room. Passing Halbert's door again, I saw him still at work, on the armor, but I did not stop in stepping out into Bleecker Street. I followed it to Wooster, skirted the grounds of the lethal chamber, and crossing Washington Park went straight to my rooms in the Benedict. Here I lunched comfortably, reading the Herald and the Meteor, and finally went to the steel safe in my bedroom and set the time combination, the three and three-quarter minutes which it is necessary to wait while the time lock is opening are to me golden moments. From the instance I set the combination to the movement, when I grasp the knobs and swing back the solid steel doors, I live in an ecstasy of expectation. Those moments must be like moments passed in paradise. I know what I am to find at the end of the time limit. I know what the massive safe holds secure for me, for me alone, and the exquisite pleasure of waiting is hardly enhanced when the safe opens and I lift from its velvet crown a diadem of purest gold blazing with diamonds, and I do this every day, and yet the joy of waiting and at last touching again the diadem only seems to increase as the days pass. It is a diadem fit for a king among kings, an emperor among emperors. The king in yellow might scorn it, but it shall be worn by his royal servant. I held it in my arms until the alarm in the safe rang harshly, and then tenderly, proudly, I replaced it and shut the steel doors. I walked slowly back to my study, which faces Washington Square, and leaned on the window sill. The afternoon sun poured into my windows, and a gentle breeze stirred the branches of the elms and maples in the park, now covered with buds and tender foliage. A flock of pigeons circled about the tower of the memorial church, sometimes alighting on the purple-tiled roof, sometimes wheeling downward to the lotto's funk fountain in front of the marble arch. The gardens were busy in the flower bed around the fountain, and the freshly turned earth smelled sweet and spicy. A lawn mower, drawn by a fat white horse, clinked across the green sward, and watering carts poured showers of spray over the asphalt drives. Around the statue of P. 
Peter Stuyvesant, which in 1897 had replaced the monstrosity supposed to represent Garibaldi. Children played in the spring sunshine, and nurse, nurse girls wheeled elaborate baby carriages with a reckless disregard for the pasty-faced occupants, which could probably be explained by the presence of half a dozen trim dragoon troopers languidly lolling on the benches. Through the trees the Washington Memorial Arch glistened like silver in the sunshine, and beyond on the eastern extremity of the square the gray stone barracks of the dragoons and the white granite artillery stables were alive with color and motion. I looked at the lethal chamber on the corner of the square opposite. A few curious people still lingered about the gilded iron railing, but inside the grounds the paths were deserted. I watched the fountains ripple and sparkle. The sparrows had already found this new bathing nook, and the basins were covered with the dusty feathered little things. Two or three white peacocks picked their way across the lawns, and a drab-colored pigeon sat so motionless on the arm of one of the fates that it seemed to be a part of the sculptured stone. As I was turning carelessly away, a slight commotion in the group of curious loiterers around the gates attracted my attention. A young man had entered, and was advancing with nervous strides along the gravel path, which leads to the bronze doors of the lethal chamber. He paused a moment before the fates, and as he raised his head to those three mysterious faces, the pigeon rose from its sculptured perch, circled about for a moment, and wheeled to the east. The young man pressed his hand to his face, and then, with an undefinable gesture, sprang up the marble steps. The bronze doors closed behind him, and half an hour later the loiterer slouched away, and the frightened pigeon returned to its perch in the arms of fate. I put on my hat and went out and depart a little while before dinner. As I crossed the central driveway, a group of officers passed, and one of them called out, Hello, Hildred! and came back to shake hands with me. It was my cousin Louis, who had stopped smiling and tapping his spurred heels with his riding whip. Just back from Westchester, he said, been doing the bucolic. Milk and curds, you know, dairy maids and sunbonnets who say, how, and I don't think, when you tell them they are pretty. I'm nearly dead for a square meal at Delmonico's. What's the news? There is none, I replied pleasantly. I saw your regiment coming in this morning. Did you? I didn't see you. Where were you? In Mr. Wilde's window. Oh, hell, he began impatiently. That man is stark mad. I don't understand why you... I saw how annoyed I felt. He saw how annoyed I felt by his outburst and begged my pardon. Really, old chap, he said, I don't mean to run down a man like you, but for the life of me I can't see what the deuce you find in common with Mr. Wilde. He's not well-bred, to put it generously. He is hideously deformed. His head is the head of a criminally insane person. You know yourself, you've been in this, and he's been in an asylum. So have I, I interrupted calmly. Louis looked startled and confused for a moment, but recovered and slapped me heartily on the shoulder. You were completely cured, he began, but I stopped him again. I suppose you mean that I was simply acknowledged never to have been insane. Of course, that's, uh, that's what I meant, he laughed. I disliked his laugh because I knew it was forced. But I nodded gaily and asked him where he was going. Louis looked after his brother officers, who had now almost reached Broadway. We have intended a sample of Brunswick cocktail, but to tell you the truth, I was anxious for an excuse to go and see Halbert instead. Come along, I'll make you my excuse. We found old Halbert, neatly attired, in a fresh spring suit, standing at the door of his shop and sniffing the air. I had just decided to take Constance for a little stroll before dinner, he replied to the impetuous volley of questions from Louis. We thought of walking on the park terrace along the North River. At that moment, Constance appeared and grew pale and rosy by turns as Louis bent over her small gloved fingers. I tried to excuse myself for alleging an engagement uptown, but Louis and Constance would not listen and I saw I was expected to remain engaged old Halbert's attention. After all, it would be just as well if I kept my eye on Louis. I thought, and when they hailed a spring 
street horse car. I got in after them and took my seat beside the armor. The beautiful line of parks and granite terraces overlooking the wharves along the North River, which were built in 1910 and finished in the autumn of 1917, had become one of the most popular promenades in the metropolis. They extended from the Battery to 109th Street, 190th Street, overlooking the noble river and affording a fine view of the Jersey Shore and the highlands opposite. Cafes and restaurants were scattered here and there among the trees, and twice a week military bands from the garrison played in the kiosks on the parapets. We sat down in the sunshine on the bench at the foot of the equestrian statue of General Sheridan. Constance tipped her sunshade to shield her eyes, and she and Louis began a murmuring conversation which was impossible to catch. Old Hallberg, leaning on his ivory-headed cane, lighted an excellent cigar, the mate to which I politely refused and smiled at vacancy. The sun hung low above the Staten Island woods, and the bay was dyed with golden hues reflected from the sun-warmed sails of the shipping in the harbor. Brigs, schooners, yachts, clumsy ferry boats, and their decks swarming with people, railroad transports carrying lines of brown, blue, and white freight cars, stately sound steamers, declass tromp steamers, coasters, dredgers, scows, and everywhere pervading the entire bay, impudent little tugs puffing and whistling officiously. These were the craft which churned the sunlight waters as far as the eye could see, in calm contrast to the hurry of sailing vessel and steamer, a silent fleet of white warships lay motionless in midstream. Constance's merry laugh aroused me from my reverie. What are you staring at? she inquired. Nothing. The fleet. I smiled. Then Louis told us what the vessels were, pointing out each by its relative position to the old red fort on Governor's Island. That little cigar-shaped thing is a torpedo box, he explained. There are four more lying close together. They are the tarpon, the falcon, the sea fox, and the octopus. The gunboats just above are the Princeton, the Champlain, the Stillwater, and the Erie. Next to them lie the cruisers Farragut and Los Angeles, and above them the battleships California and Dakota, and the Washington, which is the flagship. Those two squatty-looking chunks of metal which are anchored there off Castle William are the double-turreted monitors, terrible and magnificent. Behind them lies the ram Osceola. Constance looked at him with deep approval in her beautiful eyes. What loads of things you know for a soldier, she said, and we all joined in the laugh which followed. Presently Louis rose with a nod to us and offered his arm to Constance and they strolled along the river. Halbrook watched them for a moment and then turned to me. Mr. Wilde was right, he said. I have found the missing tassets and left Kissard from the princes emblazoned in a vile old junk garret in Pell Street. 998, I inquired with a smile. Yes. Mr. Wilde is a very intelligent man, I observed. I want to give him the credit of this most important discovery, continued Halbert, and I intend it shall be known that he is entitled to the fame of it. He won't thank you for that, I answered sharply. Please say nothing about it. Do you know what it is worth? said Halbert. No, fifty dollars, perhaps. It is valued at five hundred, but the owner of the prince's emblazon will give two thousand dollars to the person who completes his suit. That reward also belongs to Mr. Wilde. He doesn't want it. He refuses, I answered angrily. What do you know about Mr. Wilde? He doesn't need the money. He is rich, or will be, richer than any living man except myself. What will we care for money, then? What will we care, he and I, when, when, when what? demanded Halbert, astonished. You will see, I replied, on my guard again. He looked at me narrowly much as Dr. Archer used to, and I knew he thought I was mentally unsound. Perhaps it was fortunate for him that he did not use the word lunatic just then. No, I replied to his unspoken thought. I am not mentally weak. 
My mind is as healthy as Mr. Wilde's. I do not care to explain just yet what I have on hand, but it is an investment which will pay more than mere gold, silver, and precious stones. It will secure the happiness and prosperity of a continent, yes, a hemisphere. Oh, said Halbert, and eventually, I continued more quietly, it will secure the happiness of the whole world, and incidentally, your own happiness and prosperity as well as Mr. Wilde's? Exactly, I smiled, but I could have throttled him for taking that tone. He looked at me in silence for a while and then said very gently, Why don't you give up your books and studies, Mr. Castigain, and take a tramp among the mountains somewhere or other? I used to be fond of fishing. Take a cast or two at the trout and the wranglies. I don't care for fishing any more, I answered, without a shade of annoyance in my voice. I used to be fond of everything, I continued. Athletics, yachting, shooting, riding. I have never cared to ride since my fall, I said quietly. Ah, yes, your fall, he repeated, looking away from me. I thought this nonsense had gone far enough, so I brought the conversation back to Mr. Wilde. But he was scanning my face again in a highly offensive manner. Mr. Wilde, he repeated, do you know what he did this afternoon? He came downstairs and nailed a sign over the hall door next to mine. It read, Mr. Wilde, Repairer of Reputations, Third Bell. Do you know what a repairer of reputations can be? I do, I replied, suppressing the rage within. Oh, he said again. Louis and Constance came strolling by and stopped to ask if we would join them. Halbert looked at his watch. At the same moment a puff of smoke shot from the casemates of Castle William, and the boom of the sunset gun rolled across the water and was re-echoed from the highlands opposite. The flag came running down from the flagpole. The bugle sounded on the white decks of the warships, and the first electric light sparkled out from the Jersey shore. As I turned into the city with Halbrook, I heard Constance murmur something to Louis, which I did not understand. But Louis whispered, my darling, in reply, and again, walking ahead with Halbrook through the square, I heard a murmur of sweetheart and my own Constance, and I knew the time had nearly arrived when I should speak of important matters with my cousin Louis. One morning early in May, I stood before the steel safe in my bedroom, trying on the golden jeweled crown. The diamonds flashed fire as I turned to the mirror, and the heavy beaten gold burned like a halo about my head. I remembered Carmilla's agonized scream, and the awful words echoing through the dim streets of Carcosa. They were the last lines in the first act, and I dared not think of what followed. Dared not. Even in the spring sunshine, there in my own room, surrounded with familiar objects, reassured by the bustle from the street and the voices of the servants in the hallway outside, but well, those poisoned words had dropped slowly into my heart as that sweet drops upon a bedsheet and is absorbed. Trembling, I put the diadem from my head and wiped my forehead. But I thought of Hastur and of my own rifle ambition, and I remembered Mr. Wilde as I had last left him, his face all torn and bloody from the claws of that devil's creature. And what he said, ah, what he said, the alarm bell in the safe began to whirr harshly, and I knew my time was up, but I would not heed it, and replaced the flashing circlet upon my head, I turned defiantly to the mirror. I stood for a long time absorbed in the changing expression of my own eyes. The mirror reflected a face which was like my own, but whiter, and so thin that I hardly recognized it. And all the time I kept repeating between my clenched teeth, the day has come, the day has come, while the alarm in the safe whirled and clamored. The diamond sparkled and flamed above my brow. I heard a door open, but did not heed it. It was only when I saw two faces in the mirror. It was only when another face rose over my shoulder and two other eyes met mine. I wheeled like a flash, and seizing a long knife from the dressing table, my cousin screamed back, sprang back, very pale, crying, Hildred, for God's sake! Then as my hand fell, he said, It is I, Louis. Don't you know me? I stood silent. I could not have spoken for my life. He walked up to me and took the knife from my hand. What is all this? he inquired in a gentle voice. Are you ill? No, I replied, but I doubt if he heard me. 
Come, come, old fellow, he cried. Take off that brass crown and tootle into the study. Are you going to masquerade? What's all this theatrical tinsel anyway? And I was glad he thought the crown was made of brass and paste, yet I didn't like him any the better for thinking so. I let him take it from my hand, knowing it was best to humor him. He tossed a splendid diadem in the air, and catching it, turned to me, smiling. It's a deer at fifty cents, he said. What's it for? I did not answer, but took the circlet from his hands and placed it in the safe box. Shut the massive door. The alarm ceased its infernal din at once. He watched me curiously, but did not seem to notice the sudden ceasing of the alarm. He did, however, speak of the safe as a biscuit box. Fearing lest he might examine the combination, I led the wrong, I led the way into the study. Lewis threw himself on the sofa and flicked the flies with his eternal riding whip. He wore his fatigue uniform with the braided jacket and jaunty cap, and I noticed that his riding boots were all splashed with red mud. Where have you been? I inquired. Jumping mud creeks in Jersey, he said. I haven't had time to change yet. It I was rather in a hurry to see you. Haven't you got a glass of something? I'm dead tired. Been in the saddle twenty-four hours. I gave him some brandy from my medicinal store, which he drank with a grimace. Damn bad stuff, he observed. I'll give you an address where they saw brandy that is brandy. It's good enough for my needs, I said indifferently. I use it to rub my chest with. He stared and flicked at another fly. See here, old fellow, he began. I've got something to suggest for you. It's four years now that you shut yourself up here like an owl, never going anywhere, never taking any healthy exercise, never doing a damn thing but poring over those books up there in the mantelpiece. He glanced along the row of shelves. Napoleon, Napoleon, Napoleon. He read, For heaven's sake, have you nothing but Napoleons here? I wish they were bound in gold, I said. But wait, yes, there is another book. The King in Yellow. I looked him steadily in the eye. Have you read it? I asked. I? No, thank God. I don't want to be driven crazy. I saw he regretted his speech as soon as he had uttered it. There is only one word which I loathe more than I do lunatic, and that word is crazy. But I controlled myself and asked him why he thought the king in yellow dangerous. Oh, I don't know, he said hastily. I only remember the excitement it created and the denunciations from pulpit and press. I believe the author shot himself after bringing forth this monstrosity, didn't he? I understand he is still alive, I answered. That's probably true, he muttered. Bullets can't kill a fiend like that. It's a book of great truths, I said. Yes, he replied, of truths which send men frantic and blast their lives. I don't care if the thing is, as they say, the very supreme essence of art. It's a crime to have written it, and I, for one, shall never open its pages. Is that what you've come to tell me? I asked. No, he said. I came to tell you that I'm going to be married. I believe for a moment my heart ceased to beat, but I kept my eyes on his face. Yes, he continued, smiling happily, married to the sweetest girl on earth. Constance Hallberg, I said mechanically. How did you know? he cried, astonished. I didn't know it myself until that evening last April when we strolled down to the embankment after dinner. When is it to be? I asked. It was to have been next September, but an hour ago a despatch came ordering our regiment to the Presidio, San Francisco. We leave at noon tomorrow. Tomorrow, he repeated. Just think, Hildred, tomorrow I shall be the happiest fellow that ever drew breath in this jolly world, for Constance will go with me. I offered him my hand in congratulation, and he seized it and shook it like the good-natured fellow he was, or pretended to be. I'm going to get my squadron as a wedding present, he rattled on. Captain and Mrs. Louis Constagain, eh, Hildred? Then he told me where it was to be and who were to be there and made me promise to come and be best man. And I set my teeth and listened to his boyish chatter, but without showing what I felt. I was getting to the limit of my endurance. And when he jumped up and switched, switching his spurs till they jingled, said he must go. I did not detain him. There's one thing I want to ask of you, I said quietly. Out with it. It's promised, he laughed. I want you to meet me for a quarter of an hour tonight to talk. Of course, if you wish, he said, somewhat puzzled. Where? Anywhere. In the park there. What time, Hildred? Midnight. What in the name of? He began, but checked himself 
and laughingly assented. I watched him go down the stairs and hurry away, his saber banging at every stride. He turned into Bleecker Street, and I knew he was going to see Constance. I gave him ten minutes to disappear, and then followed in his footsteps, taking with me the jeweled crown and the silken robe embroidered with the yellow sign. When I turned into Bleecker Street and entered the doorway which bore the sign, Mr. Wilde, Repairer of Reputations, Third Bell, I saw old Hallberg moving about in his shop, and I imagined I heard Constance's voice in the parlor, but I avoided them both and hurried up the trembling stairways to Mr. Wilde's apartment. I knocked and entered without ceremony. Mr. Wilde lay groaning on the floor, his face covered with blood, his clothes torn to shreds. Drops of blood were scattered about over the carpet, which had also been ripped and frayed in the evidently recent struggle. It's that cursed cat, he said, ceasing his groans and turning his colorless eyes to me. She attacked me while I was asleep. I believe she will kill me yet. This was too much, so I went into the kitchen and, seizing a hatchet from the pantry, started to find the infernal beast and settle her then and there. My search was fruitless, and after a while I gave it up and came back to find Mr. Wilde squatting on his high chair by the table. He had washed his face and changed his clothes. The great furrows which the cat's claws had plowed up in his face he had filled with collodion, and a rag hid the wound in his throat. I told him I should kill the cat when I came across her, but he only shook his head and turned to the open ledger before him. He read name after name of the people who had come to him in regard to their reputation and the sum he had amassed were startling. I put on the screws now and then, he explained. One day or other, some of these people will assassinate you, I insisted. Do you think so? He said, rubbing his mutilated ears. It was useless to argue with him. So I took down the manuscript entitled Imperial Dynasty of America. For the last time I should ever take it down in Mr. Wilde's study, I read it through, thrilling and trembling with pleasure. When I had finished, Mr. Wilde took the manuscript and turned to the dark passage which leads from his study to his bedchamber, called out in a loud voice, Vance. Then, for the first time, I noticed a man crouching there in the shadow. How I had overlooked him during my search for the cat, I cannot imagine. Vance, come in, cried Mr. Wilde. The figure rose and crept towards us. I shall never forget the face that he raised to mine as the light from the window illuminated. Vance, this is Mr. Castigain, said Mr. Wilde. Before he had finished speaking, the man threw himself on the ground before the table, crying and grasping. Oh, God, oh, God, help me, forgive me. Oh, Mr. Castigain, keep that man away. You cannot, you cannot mean it. You are different. Save me. I am broken down. I was in a madhouse, and now, when all was coming right, when I had forgotten the king, the king in yellow, but I shall go mad again. I shall go mad. His voice died in a choking rattle, for Mr. Wilde had leapt on him, and his right hand encircled the man's throat. When Vance fell in a heap on the floor, Mr. Wilde clambered nimbly into his chair again, and rubbing his mangled ears with the stump of his hand, turned to me and asked me for the ledger. I reached it down from the shelf, and he opened it. After a moment, searching among the beautifully written pages, he coughed complacently and pointed to the name Vance. Vance, he read aloud, Osgood Oswald Vance. At the sound of his name, the man on the floor raised his head and turned a convulsed face to Mr. Wilde. His eyes were injected with blood, his lips tumefied. Called April 28th, continued Mr. Wilde. Occupation, cashier in the Seaforth National Bank, has served a term of forgery at Sing Sing, from whence he was transferred to the Asylum for the Criminally Insane, pardoned by the Governor of New York and discharged from the Asylum, January 19, 1918, reputation damaged at Sheep's Head Bay. Rumors that he lives beyond his income. Reputation to be repaired at once, Retainer, $1,500. Note, he embezzled sums amounting to $30,000 since March 20th, 1919. Excellent family and secured present position through uncle's influence. Father, president of Seaforth Bank. I looked at the man on the floor. Get up, Vance, said Mr. Wilde in a gentle voice. Vance rose as if hypnotized. He will do as we suggest now, observed Mr. Wilde. 
and opening the manuscript, he read the entire history of the imperial dynasty of America. Then, in a kind and soothing voice, he ran over the important points with Vance, who stood like one stunned. His eyes were so blank and vacant that I imagined he had become half-witted, and remarked it to Mr. Wilde, who replied that it was of no consequence anyway. Very patiently we pointed out to Vance what his share in the affair would be, and he seemed to understand after a while. Mr. Wilde explained the manuscript, using several volumes on heraldry, to substantiate the rest, result of his researches. He mentioned the establishment of the dynasty in Carcosa, the lakes which connected Haster, Aldebaran, and the mystery of the Hyades. He spoke of Casilda and Camilla, and sounded the cloudy depths of Deme and the lake of Holly. The scolloped tatters of the king in yellow must hide Yiddle forever, he muttered, but I do not believe Vance heard him. Then, by degrees, he led Vance along the ramifications of the imperial family, to Oak and Thale, from the Talba and the Phantom of Truth to Aldonis, and then, tossing aside his manuscript and notes, he began the wonderful story of the last king. Fascinated and thrilled, I watched him. He threw up his head. His long arms were stretched out in a magnificent gesture of pride and power, and his eyes blazed deep in their sockets like two emeralds. Vance listened, stupefied. As for me, when at last Mr. Wilde had finished and pointing to me, cried, The cousin of the king! My head swam with excitement. Controlling myself, with superhuman effort, I explained to Vance why I alone was worthy of the crown and why my cousin must be exiled or die. I'm, I made him understand that my cousin must never marry, even after renouncing all his claims and how the least of all he should marry the daughter of the Marquis of Avonshire and bring England into the question. I showed him a list of thousands of names which Mr. Wilde had drawn up. Every man whose name was there had received the yellow sign which no living human being dared disregard. The city, the state, the whole land were ready to rise and tremble before the pallid mask. The time had come. The people should know the son of Haster, and the whole world bow to the black stars which hang in the sky over Carcosa. Vance leaned on the table, his head buried in his hands. Mr. Wilde drew a rough sketch on the margin of yesterday's herald with a bit of lead pencil. It was a plan of Halbrook's rooms. Then he wrote out the order and it fixed the seal. And shaking like a palsied man, I signed my first writ of execution with my name, Hildred Rex. Mr. Wilde clambered to the floor and, unlocking the cabinet, took a long square box from the first shelf. This he brought to the table and opened. A new knife lay in the tissue paper inside, and I picked it up and handed it to Vance, along with the order and the plan of Halbrook's apartment. Then Mr. Wilde told Vance he could go, and he went, shambling like an outcast of the slums. I sat for a while, watching the daylight fade behind the square tower of the Judson Memorial Church, and finally, gathering up the manuscript and notes, took my hat and started for the door. Mr. Wilde watched me in silence. When I had stepped into the hall, I looked back. Mr. Wilde's small eyes were still fixed on me. Behind him, the shadows gathered in the fading light. Then I closed the door behind me and went out into the darkening streets. I had eaten nothing since breakfast, but I was not hungry. A wretched, half-starved creature who stood looking across the street at the lethal chamber noticed me and came up to tell me a tale of misery. I gave him money. I don't know why and he went away without thanking me. An hour later, another outcast approached and whined his story. I bit a blank bit of paper in my pocket on which was traced the yellow sign, and I handed it to him. He looked at it stupidly for a moment, and then, with an uncertain gaze at me, folded it with what seemed to be exaggerated care and placed it in his bosom. The electric lights were sparkling among the trees, and the new moon shone in the sky above the lethal chamber, it was tiresome waiting in the square. I wandered from the marble arch to the artillery stables and back again to the lotus fountain. The flowers and grass exhaled a fragrance which troubled me. The jet of the fountain played in the moonlight, and the musical splash of falling drops reminded me of the tinkle of chain mail in Halbrook's shop. But it was not so fascinating, and the dull sparkle of the moonlight on the water brought 
no such sensations of exquisite pleasure as when the sunshine played over the polished steel of a corselet on Halberg's knee. I watched the bats darting and turning above the water plants in the fountain basin, but their rapid, jerky flight set my nerves on edge, and I went away again to walk aimlessly to and fro among the trees. <clears throat> the artillery stables were dark, but in the cavalry barracks the officers' windows were brightly lit, and the sally port was constantly filled with troopers in fatigue, carrying straw and harnesses and baskets filled with tin dishes. Twice the mounted sentry at the gates was changed while I wandered up and down the asphalt walk. I looked at my watch. It was nearly time. The lights in the barrack went out one by one. The barred gate was closed, and every minute or two an officer passed in through the side wicket, leaving a rattle of accoutrements and a jingle of spurs on the night air. The square had become very silent. The last homeless loiterer had been driven away by the gray-coated park policeman. A car tracked along Wooster Street, and the only sound which broke the stillness was the stamping of the sentry's horse and the ring of his saber against the saddle pommel. In the barracks, the officers' quarters were still lighted, and military servants passed and repassed before the bay windows. Twelve o'clock sounded from the new spire of St. Francis Xavier, and at the last stoke of the sad-toned bell, a figure passed through the wicket beside the portcullis, returned the salute of the sentry, and crossing the street, entered the square and advanced toward the Benedict apartment house. Louis, I called. The man pivoted on his spurred heels and came straight toward me. Is that you, Hildred? Yes, you are on time. I took his offered hand, and we strolled toward the lethal chamber. He rattled on about his wedding and the graces of Constance and their future prospects, calling my attention to his captain's shoulder straps and the trickle, triple gold arabesque on his sleeve and fatigue cap. I believe I listened as much to the music of his spurs and saber as I did to his boyish babble. And at last we stood under the elms on the fourth street corner of the square opposite the lethal chamber. Then he laughed and asked me what I wanted with him. I motioned him to a seat on a bench under the electric light and sat down beside him. He looked at me curiously, with that same searching glance which I hate and fear so in doctors. I felt the insult of his look, but he did not know it, and I carefully concealed my feelings. Well, old chap, he inquired, what can I do for you? I drew from my pocket the manuscript and notes of the Imperial Dynasty of America, and looking him in the eye said, I will tell you, on your word as a soldier, Promise me to read this manuscript from beginning to end without asking me a question. Promise me to read these notes in the same way and promise me to listen to what I have to tell later. I promise, if you wish it, he said pleasantly. Give me the paper, Hildred. He began to read, raising his eyebrows with a puzzled, whimsical air which made me tremble with suppressed anger. As he advanced, his eyebrows contracted and his lips seemed to form the word rubbish. Then he looked slightly bored, but apparently for my sake read, with an attempt at interest, which presently ceased to be an effort. He started when, in the closely written pages, he came to his own name, and when he came to mine he lowered the paper and looked sharply at me for a moment, but he kept his word and resumed his reading, and I let the half-formed question die on his lips unanswered. When he came to the end and read the signature of Mr. Wilde, he folded the paper carefully and returned it to me. <clears throat> I handed him the notes, and he settled back, pushing his fatigued cap up to his forehead. With a boyish gesture, which I remembered so well in school, I watched his face as he read, and when he finished I took the notes with the manuscript and placed them in my pocket. Then I unfolded a scroll marked with the yellow sign. He saw the sign, but he did not seem to recognize it and I called his attention to it somewhat sharply. Well, he said, I see it. What is it? It is the yellow sign, I said angrily. Oh, that's it, is it? said Louis in a flattering voice, which Dr. Archer used to employ with me and would probably have employed again had I not settled his affair for him. I kept my rage down and answered as steadily as possible. Listen, you have engaged your word? 
I am listening, old chap, he replied soothingly. I began to speak very calmly. Dr. Archer, having by some means become possessed of the secret of the imperial secession, attempted to deprive me of my right, alleging that because of a fall from my horse four years ago I had become mentally deficient. He presumed to place me under restraint in his own house in hopes of either driving me insane or poisoning me. I have not forgotten it. I visited him last night and the interview was final. Louis turned quite pale but did not move. I resumed triumphantly. There are yet three people to be interviewed in the interests of Mr. Wilde and myself. They are my cousin Louis, Mr. Halbert, and his daughter Constance. Louis sprang to his feet, and I arose also, and flung the paper marked with a yellow sign to the ground. Oh, I don't need to tell you what I have to say, I cried with a laugh of triumph. You must renounce the crown to me, do you hear? To me. Louis looked at me with a startled air, but recovering himself, said kindly, Of course I renounce the... What, what is it? I must renounce the crown, I said angrily. Of course, he said, I renounce it. Come, old chap, I'll walk back to your rooms with you. <clears throat> Don't try any of your doctor's tricks on me, I cried, trembling with fury. Don't act as if you think I am insane. What nonsense, he replied. Come, it's getting late, Hildred. No, I shouted, you must listen. You cannot marry. I forbid it. Do you hear? I forbid it. You shall renounce the crown, and in reward I grant you exile. But if you refuse, you shall die. He tried to calm me, but I was roused at last. My, and drawing my long knife, barred his way. Then I told him how they would find Dr. Archer in the cellar with his throat open, and I laughed in his face when I thought of Vance and his knife, and the order signed by me. Ah, you are the king, I cried, but I shall be the king. Who are you to keep me from empire over all the habitable earth? I was born the cousin of a king. I shall be king. Louis stood white and rigid before me. Suddenly a man came running up 4th Street, entered the gate of the lethal temple, traversed the path to the bronze doors at full speed, and plunged into the death chamber with the cry of one demented. And I laughed until I wept tears, for I had recognized Vance, and knew that Hauberk and his daughter were no longer in my way. Go, I cried to Louis. You have ceased to be a menace. You will never marry Constance now, and if you marry anyone else in your exile, I will visit you as I did my doctor last night. Mr. Wilde takes charge of you tomorrow. Then I turned and darted into South Fifth Avenue, and with a cry of terror, Louis dropped his belt and saber and followed me like the wind. I heard him close behind me at the corner of Bleecker Street, and I dashed into the doorway under Halbrook's sign. He cried, Halt! or I fire. But when he saw that I flew up the stairs, leaving Halbrook's shop open, he left me, and I heard him hammering and shouting at the door as though it were possible to arouse the dead. Mr. Wilde's door was open, and I entered crying, It is done, it is done, let the nations rise up and look upon their king. But I could not find Mr. Wilde, so I went into the cabinet and took the splendid diadem from its case then I drew on the white silk robe embroidered with the yellow sign and placed the crown upon my head. At last I was king, king by my right in Haster, king because I knew the mystery of the Hyades and my mind had sounded the depths of the Lake of Holly. I was king. The first gray pencilings of dawn would raise a tempest which would shake two hemispheres. Then, as I stood, my every nerve pitched to the highest tension, faint with the joy and splendor of my thought, Without, in the dark passage, a, ma a man groaned. I seized the tallow dip and sprang to the door. The cat passed me like a demon, and the tallow dip went out. But my long knife flew swifter than she, and I heard her screech. And I heard, and I knew that my knife had found her. For a moment I listened to her trembling and thumping about in the darkness, and then, when her frenzy ceased, I lighted a lamp and raised it over my head. Mr. Wilde lay on the floor with his throat open. At first I thought he was dead, but as I looked, 
A green sparkle came into his sunken eyes. His mutilated hand trembled, and then a spasm stretched his mouth from ear to ear. For a moment my terror and despair gave place to hope, but as I bent over him his eyeballs rolled clean round in his head and he died. Then while I stood, transfixed with rage and despair, seeing my crown, my empire, every hope and every ambition, my very life, lying prostrate there with the dead master, they came, seized me from behind and bound me until my veins stood out like cords and my voice failed with the paroxysms of my frenzied screams. But I still raged, bleeding and infuriated among them, and more than one policeman felt my sharp teeth. Then, when I could no longer move, they came nearer. I saw old Hallberg, and behind him, my lovely co cousin Louis' ghastly face, and farther away in the corner, a woman, Constance, weeping softly. Ah, I see it now, I shrieked. You have seized the throne and the empire. Woe, woe to you who are crowned with the crown of the king in yellow. A note. Mr. Castigain died yesterday in the asylum for criminal insane. The mask. Camilla, you, sir, should unmask. Stranger, indeed. Casilda, indeed, it's time. We all have laid aside disguise but you. Stranger, I wear no mask. Camilla, terrified, aside to Casilda. No mask? No mask? The King in Yellow, Act One, Scene One, Scene Two. Although I knew nothing of chemistry, I listened, fascinated. He picked up an Easter lily, which Genevieve had brought that morning from Notre Dame, and dropped it into the basin. Instantly the liquid lost its crystalline clearness. For a second the lily was enveloped in a milky white foam, which disappeared, leaving the fluid opalescent. Changing tints of orange and crimson played over the surface, and then what seemed to be a ray of pure sunlight struck through from the bottom where the lily was resting. At the same instant he plunged his hand into the basin and drew out the flower. There is no danger, he explained, if you choose the right moment. That golden ray is the signal. He held the lily toward me, and I took it in my hand. It had turned to stone, to the purest marble. You see, he said, it is without a flaw. What sculptor could reproduce it? The marble was white as snow, but in its depths the veins of the lily were tinged with palest azure, and a faint flush lingered deep in its heart. Don't ask me the reason of that, he smiled, noticing my wonder. I have no idea why the veins and heart are tinted, but they always are. Yesterday I tried one of Genevieve's goldfish. There it is. The fish looked as if sculpted in marble, but if you held it to the light, the stone was beautifully veined with a faint blue, and from somewhere within came a rosy light, like the tint which slumbers in an opal. I looked into the basin. Once more it seemed filled with clearest crystal. If I should touch it now, I demanded. I don't know he replied, but you had better not try. There is one thing I'm curious about, I said, and that is where the ray of sunlight came from. It looked like a sunbeam, true enough, he said. I don't know. It always comes when I immerse any living thing. Perhaps, he continued smiling, perhaps it is the vital spark of the creature escaping to the source from whence it came. I saw he was mocking and threatened him with a mall stick, but he only laughed and changed the subject. Stay to lunch. Genevieve will be here directly. I saw her going to early mass, I said, and she looked as fresh and sweet as that lily before you destroyed it. Do you think I destroyed it? said Boris gravely. Destroyed? Preserved? How can we tell? We sat in the corner of the studio near his unfinished group of the fates. He leaned back on the sofa, twirling the sculptor's chisel and squinting at his work. By the way, he said, I have finished pointing 
up that old academic Ariadne, and I suppose it will have to go to the Salon. It's all I have ready this year, but after the success the Madonna brought me, I feel ashamed to send a thing like that. The Madonna, an exquisite marble for which Genevieve had sat, had been the sensation of last year's Salon. I looked at the Ariadne. It was a magnificent piece of technical work, but I agreed with Boris that the world would expect something better of him than that. Still, it was impossible now to think of finishing in time for the Salon, that stupid, terrible group half-shrouded in the marble behind me. The fates would have to wait. We were proud of Boris Vane. We claimed him and he claimed us on the strength of his having been born in America, although his father was French and his mother was Russian. Everyone in the Brie arts called him Boris, and yet there were only two of us whom he addressed in the same familiar way, Jack Scott and myself. Perhaps my being in love with Genevieve had something to do with his affections for me, not that it had ever been acknowledged between us, but after all was settled and she had told me with tears in her eyes that it was Boris whom she loved, I went over to his house and congratulated him. The perfect cordiality of that evening did not deceive either of us. I always believed, although to one at least it was a great comfort, I do not think he and Genevieve ever spoke of the matter together. But Boris knew. Genevieve was lovely. The Madonna-like purity of her face might have been inspired by the Sanctus in Gernard's Mass, but I was always glad when she changed the mood for what we called her April maneuvers. She was often as variable as an April day. In the morning grave, dignified and sweet, at noon laughing, capricious, at evening whatever one least expected. I preferred her so rather than in that Madonna-like tranquility which stirred the depths of my heart. I was dreaming of Genevieve when he spoke again. What do you think of my discovery, Alec? I think it is wonderful. I shall make no use of it, you know, beyond satisfying my own curiosity so far as may be. And the secret will die with me. It would be rather a blow to sculpture, would it not? We painters lose more than we ever gain by photography. Boris nodded, playing with the edge of the chisel. This new vicious discovery would corrupt the world of art. No, I shall never confide the secret to anyone, he said slowly. It would be hard to find anyone less informed about such phenomena than myself, but of course I had heard of mineral springs so saturated with silica that the leaves and twigs which fell into them were turned to stone after a time. I dimly comprehended the process, how the silica replaced the vegetable matter, atom by atom, and the result was a duplicate of the object in stone. But, I confess, this had never interested me greatly, and as for the ancient fossils thus produced, they disgusted me. Boris, it appeared, feeling curiosity instead of repugnance, had investigated the subject and had accidentally stumbled on a solution which, attacking the immersed object with a ferocity unheard of, in a second did the work of years. This was all I could make out of the strange story he had just been telling me. He spoke again after a long silence. I am almost frightened when I think what I have found. Scientists would go mad over the discovery. It was so simple, too. It discovered itself. When I think of that formula and that new element precipitated in metallic scales, what new element? Oh, I haven't thought of naming it, and I don't believe I ever shall. There are enough precious metals now in the world to cut throats over. I pricked up my ears. Have you struck gold, Boris? No, better. But see here, Alec, he laughed, starting up. You and I have all we need in this world. Ah, uh, how sinister and covetous you look already. I laughed, too, and told him I was devoured by the desire for gold and we had better talk of something else. So when Genevieve came in shortly after, we had turned our backs on alchemy. Genevieve was dressed in silvery gray from head to foot. 
The light glinted along the soft curves of her fair hair as she turned her cheek to Boris. Then she saw him and returned my greeting. She had never before failed to blow me a kiss from the tips of her white fingers, and I promptly complained of the omission. She smiled and held out her hand, which dropped almost before it had touched mine. Then she said, looking at Boris, You must ask Alec to stay for luncheon. This also was something new. She had always asked me herself until today. I did, said Boris shortly. And you said yes, I hope. She turned to me with a charming conventional smile. I might have been an acquaintance of the day before yesterday. I made her a long bow. Je vais bien le honneur, madame. But refusing to take up our usual bantering tone, she murmured a hospitable commonplace and disappeared. Boris and I looked at one another. I'd better go home, don't you think? I asked. Hanged if I know, he replied frankly. While we were discussing the advisability of my departure, Genevieve reappeared in the doorway without her bonnet. She was wonderfully beautiful, but her color was too deep and her lovely eyes were too bright. She came straight up to me and took my arm. Luncheon is ready. Was I cross, Alec? I thought I had a headache, but I haven't. Come here, Boris, and she slipped her other arm through his. Alec knows that after you there is no one in the world whom I like as well as I like him, so if he sometimes feels snubbed, it won't hurt him. A la bonheur, I cried. Who says there are no thunderstorms in April? Are you ready? chanted Boris. Aye, ready. And arm in arm we raced into the dining room, scandalizing the servants. After all, we were not so much to blame. Genevieve was eighteen, Boris was twenty-three, and I was not quite twenty-one. Some work that I was doing about this time on the decorations for Genevieve's boudoir kept me constantly at the quaint little hotel in the row Saint-Cile, Santa Cecile. Boris and I in those days labored hard, but as we pleased, which was fitfully, and we all three with Jack Scott, idled a great deal together. One quiet afternoon I had been wandering alone over the house, examining curios, prying into odd corners, bringing out sweetmeats and cigars from strange hiding places, and at last I stopped in the bathing room. Boris, all over clay, stood there washing his hands. The room was built of rose-colored marble, excepting the floor, which was tessellated in rose and gray. In the center was a square pool sunken below the surface of the floor. Steps led down into it. Sculptured pillars supported a frescoed ceiling. A delicious marble cupid appeared to have just alighted on his pedestal at the upper end of the room. The whole interior was Boris's work and mine. Boris, in his working clothes of white canvas, scraped the traces of clay and red modeling wax from his handsome hands and coqueted over his shoulder with the cupid. I see you, he said. Don't try to look the other way and pretend not to see me. You know who made you, little humbug? It was always my role to interpret cupid's sentiments in his conversations, and when my turn came I responded in such a manner that Boris seized my arm and dragged me toward the pool, declaring he would dunk me in. Next instant he dropped my arm and turned pale. Good God, he said, I forgot the pool was full of the solution. I shivered a little and dryly advised him to remember better when he had stored the precious liquid. In heaven's name, why do you keep a small lake of that gruesome stuff here of all places? I asked. I want to experiment on something large, he replied. On me, for instance? Ah, uh, that came too close for jesting, but I do want to watch the action of that solution on a more highly organized living body. There's that big white rabbit, he said, following me into the studio. Jack Scott, wearing a paint-stained jacket, <clears throat> came wandering in, appropriated all the oriental sweetmeats he could lay his hands on, <clears throat> looted the cigarette case, and finally he and Boris disappeared together to visit the Luxembourg Gallery where a new silver bronze by Rodin and a landscape of Monet's were claiming the exclusive attention of artistic France. I went back to the studio and resumed my work. 
It was a Renaissance screen, which Boris wanted me to paint for Genevieve's boudoir, but the small boy who was unwillingly dwaddled through a series of poses for it today refused all bribes to be good. He never rested an instant in the same position, and inside of five minutes I had as many different outlines of the little bugger. Are you posing or are you executing a song and dance, my friend? I inquired. Whichever monsieur pleases, he replied with an angelic smile. Of course I dismissed him for the day, and of course I paid him for the full time, that being the way we spoil our models. After the young imp had gone, I made a few perfunctory daubs at my work, but was so thoroughly out of humor that it took me the rest of the afternoon to undo the damage I had done. So at last I scraped my palette, <clears throat> struck my brushes in a bowl of black soap, and strolled into the smoking room. I really believed that, excepting Genevieve's apartments, no room in the house was so free from the perfume of tobacco as this one. It was a queer chaos of odds and ends, hung with threadbare tapestry. A sweet-toned old spinet, in good repair, stood by the window. There were stands of weapons, some old and dull, others bright and modern, festoons of Indian and Turkish armor over the mantel, two or three good pictures, and a pipe rack. It was here that we used to come for new sensations in smoking. I doubt if any type of pipe ever existed which was not represented in that rack. When we had selected one, we immediately carried it somewhere else and smoked it, for the place was, on the whole, more gloomy and less inviting than any in the house. But this afternoon the twilight was very soothing. The rugs and skins of the floor looked brown and soft and drowsy. The big couch was piled with cushions. I found my pipe and curled up there for an unaccustomed smoke in the smoking room. I had chosen one with a long, flexible stem, and lighting it fell to dreaming. After a while it went out, but I did not stir. I dreamed on and presently fell asleep. I woke to the saddest music I had ever heard. The room was quite dark. I had no idea what time it was. A ray of moonlight silvered one edge of the old spinet and the polished wood seemed to exhale the sounds as perfume floats above a box of sandalwood. Someone rose in the darkness and came away weeping quietly, and I was fool enough to cry out, Genevieve? She dropped at my voice, and I had time to curse myself when I made a light and tried to raise her from the floor. She shrank away with a murmur of pain. She was very quiet, and I asked for Boris, and asked for Boris. I carried her to the divan and went to look for him, but he was not in the house, and the servants were gone to bed. Perplexed and anxious, I hurried back to Genevieve. She lay there where I had left her, looking very white. I can't find Boris nor any of his servants, I said. I know, she said faintly. Boris has gone to Ept with Mr. Scott. I did not remember when I sent you for him just now. But he can't get back in that case before tomorrow afternoon, and are you hurt? Did I frighten you into falling? What an awful fool I am, but I was only half awake. Boris thought you had gone home before dinner. Do please excuse us for letting you stay here all this time. I have had a long nap, I laughed, so sound that I did not know whether I was still asleep or not, when I found myself staring at a figure that was moving toward me and called out your name. Have you been trying the old spinet? You must have played very softly. I would tell a thousand more lies, worse than that one, to see the look of relief that came into her face. She smiled adorably and said in her natural tone, Alec, I tripped on that wolf's head, and I think my ankle was sprained. Please call Marie and then go home. I did as she bade me and left her there when the maid came in. At noon the next day, when I called, I found Boris walking restlessly about his studio. Genevieve is asleep now, he told me. The sprain is nothing. But why should she have such a high fever? The doctor can't account for it, or else he will not, he muttered. Genevieve has a fever, I asked. I should say so, and has actually been a little light-headed at intervals all night. The idea, gay little Genevieve, without a care in the world. 
and she keeps saying her heart's broken and she wants to die. My own heart stood still. Boris leaned against the door of his studio, looking down, his hands in his pockets, his kind, keen eyes clouded, a new line of trouble drawn. Over the mouth's good mark that made the smile, the maid had orders to summon him the instant Genevieve opened her eyes. We waited and waited, and Boris, growing restless, wandered about, fussing with modeling wax and red clay. Suddenly, he started for the next room. Come and see my rose-colored bath full of death, he cried. Is it death? I asked, to humor his mood. You are not prepared to call it life, I suppose, he answered. As he spoke, he plucked a solitary goldfish, squirming and twisting out of its globe. We'll send this one after the other. Wherever that is, he said, there was feverish excitement in his voice. A dull weight of fever lay in my limbs and my brain as I followed him to the fair crystal pool with its pink-tinted sides, and he dropped the creature in. Falling, its scales splashed with a hot orange gleam in its angry twistings and contortions. The moment it struck the liquid, it became rigid and sank heavily to the bottom. Then came the milky foam, the splendid hues radiating on the surface, and then the shaft of pure, serene light broke through from seemingly infinite depths. Boris plunged in his hand and drew out an exquisite marble thing, blue-veined, rose-tinted, and glistening with opalescent drops. Child's play, he muttered, and looking wearily, longingly at me as if I could answer such questions. But Jack Scott came in and entered into the game, as he called it, with ardor. Nothing would do but to try the experiment on the white rabbit then and there, I was willing that Boris should find distraction from his cares, but I hated to see the life go out of a warm living creature, and I decided I declined to be present. Picking up a book at random, I sat down in the studio to read. Alas, I had found a king in yellow. After a few moments, which seemed ages, I was putting it away with a nervous shudder. When Boris and Jack came in, bringing their marble rabbit, at the same time the bell rang above, and a cry came from the sick room. Boris was gone like a flash, and the next moment he called, Jack, run for the doctor, bring him back with you. Alec, come here. I went and stood at her door. A frightened maid came out in haste and ran away to fetch some remedy. Genevieve, sitting bolt upright with crimson cheeks and glittering eyes, babbled incessantly and resisted Boris's gentle restraint. He called me to help. At my first touch, she sighed and sank back, closing her eyes, and then, then as we still bent over her, she opened them again, <clears throat> looked straight into Boris's face, poor fever-crazed girl, and told her secret. At the same moment, our three lives turned into new channels. The bond that held us so long together snapped forever, and a new bond, <clears throat> was forged in its place, for she had spoken my name, and as the fever tortured her, her heart poured out its load of hidden sorrow. Amazed and dumb, I bowed my head while my face burned like a live coal, and the blood surged in my ears, stupefying me with its clamor. Incapable of movement, incapable of speech, I listened to her feverish words in an agony of shame and sorrow. I could not silence her. I could not look at Boris, then I felt an arm on my shoulder, and Boris turned a bloodless face to mine. It's not your fault, Alec. Don't grieve so if she loves you. But he could not finish, and as the doctor stepped swiftly into the room, saying, Ah, the fever, I seized Jack Scott and hurried him to the street, saying, Boris would rather be alone. We crossed the street to our own apartments, and that night, <clears throat> seeing I was going to be ill too, he went for the doctor again. The last thing I recollect with any distinctness was hearing Jack say, For heaven's sake, doctor, what ails him to wear a face like that? I thought of the king in yellow and the pallid mask. I was very ill with the strain of two years, which I had endured since that fatal May morning when Genevieve murmured, I love you, but I think I love Boris best, told on me at last. 
I had never imagined that it could become more than I could endure. Outwardly tranquil, I had deceived myself. Although the inward battle raged night after night, and I, lying alone in my room, cursed myself for rebellious thoughts, unloyal to Boris and unworthy of Genevieve, the morning always brought relief, and I returned to Genevieve and to my dear Boris, and with a heart washed clean by the tempests of the night. Never in word or deed or thought, while with them had I betrayed my sorrow, even to myself. The mask of self-deception was no longer a mask for me. It was a part of me. Night lifted it, laying bare the stifled truth below. But there was no one to see except myself. And when the day broke, the mask fell back again of its own accord. These thoughts passed through my troubled mind as I lay sick. But they were hopelessly entangled with visions of white creatures, heavy as stone, crawling about in Boris's basin, of the wolf's head on the rug, foaming and snapping at Genevieve, who lay smiling beside it. I thought, too, of the king in yellow, wrapped in the fantastic colors of his tattered mantle, and that bitter cry of Casilda, Not upon us, O king, not upon us. Feverishly I struggled to put it from me, but I saw the lake of holly, thin and blank, without a ripple or wind to stir it, and I saw the towers of Carcosa behind the moon, Aldebaran, Dihades, Alar, Hastur, glided through the cloud rifts which fluttered and flapped as they passed, like the scarlet tatters of the king in yellow. Among all these, one sane thought persisted. It never wavered, no matter what else was going on in my disordered mind, that my chief reason for existence was to meet some requirement of Boris and Genevieve. What this obligation was, its nature, was never clear. Sometimes it seemed to be protection, sometimes support, through a great crisis. Whatever it seemed to be for the time, its weight rested only on me, and I was never so ill or weak that I did not respond with my whole soul. There were always crowds of faces about me, mostly strange, but a few I recognized, Boris among them. Afterward, they told me that this could not have been, and I know that once, at least, he bent over me. It was only a touch, a faint echo of his voice. Then the clouds settled back on my senses, and I lost him. But he did stand there and bend over me, once, at least. At last, one morning, I awoke to find the sunlight falling across my bed, and Jack Scott reading beside me. I had not strength enough to speak aloud, neither could I think, much less remember, but I could smile feebly as Jack's eye met mine, and when he jumped up and asked eagerly if I wanted anything, I could whisper, Yes, Boris. Jack moved to the head of my bed and leaned down to arrange my pillows. I did not see his face, but he answered me heartily, You must wait, Alec. You are too weak to see even Boris. I waited, and I grew stronger. In a few days I was able to see whom I would, but meanwhile I had thought and remembered. From the moment when all the past grew clear again in my mind, I never doubted what I should do when the time came, and I felt sure that Boris would have resolved upon the same course so far as he was concerned. As for what pertained to me alone, I knew he would see that also as I did, I no longer asked for anyone. I never required why no message came from them. Why during the week I lay there waiting and growing stronger. I never heard their name spoken, preoccupied with my own searchings for the right way and with my feeble but determined fight against despair. I simply acquiesced in Jack's reticence, taking for granted that he was afraid to speak of them lest I should turn unruly and insist on seeing them. Meanwhile, I said over and over to myself, how would it be when life began again for us all? We would take up our relations exactly as they were before Genevieve fell ill. Boris and I would look into each other's eyes, and there would be neither rancor nor cowardice nor mistrust in that glance. I would be with them again for a, a little while, in the dear intimacy of their home, and then, without pretext or explanation, 
I would disappear from their lives forever. Boris would know, Genevieve, the only comfort was that she would never know. It seemed, as I thought it over, that I had found the meaning of that sense of obligation which had persisted all through my delirium, and the only possible answer to it. So, when I was quite ready, I beckoned Jack to me one day, and I said, Jack, I want Boris at once, and take my dearest greeting to Genevieve. When at last he made me understand that they were both dead, I fell into a wild rage that tore all my little convalescent strength to atoms, I raved and cursed myself into a relapse, from which I crawled forth some weeks afterward a boy of twenty-one who believed that his youth was gone forever. It seemed to be past the cap capability of further suffering. And one day, when Jack handed me a letter and the keys to Boris's house, I took them without a tremor and asked him to tell me all. It was cruel of me to ask him, but there was no help for it, and he leaned wearily on his thin hands. He reopened the wound which could never entirely heal. He began very quietly. Alec, unless you have a clue that I know nothing about, you will not be able to explain any more than I what has happened. I suspect that you would rather not hear these details, but you must learn them, else I would spare you the relation. God knows, I wish I could be spared the telling. I shall use few words. The day when I left you in the doctor's care and came back to Boris, I found him working on the fates. Genevieve, he said, was sleeping under the influence of drugs. She had been quite out of her mind, he said. He kept on working, not talking any more, and I watched him. Before long, I saw that the third figure of the group, the one looking straight ahead, out over the world, bore his face, not as you ever saw it, but as it looked then and to the end. This is one thing for which I should like to find an explanation, but... I never shall. Well, he worked, and I watched him in silence, and we went on that way until nearly midnight. Then we heard the door open and shut sharply in a swift rush into the next room. Boris sprang through the doorway, and I followed, but we were too late. She lay at the bottom of the pool, her hands across her breast. Then Boris shot himself through the heart. Jack stopped speaking. Drops of sweat stood under his eyes, and his thin cheeks twitched. I called Boris to his room, then I went back and let that hellish fluid out of the pool and turned on all the water, washed the marble clean of every drop. When at length I dared descend the steps, I found her lying there, as white as snow. At last, when I had decided what was best to do, I went into the laboratory and first emptied the solution in the basin into the waste pipe, and then I poured the contents of every jar and bottle after it. There was wood in the fireplace, so I built a fire, and breaking the locks of Boris's cabinet, I burnt every paper, notebook, and letter that I found there. With a mallet from the studio, I smashed to pieces all the empty bottles. Then loading them into a coal scuttle, I carried them to the cellar and threw them over the red-hot bed of the furnace. Six times I made the journey, and at last not a vestige remained of anything which might again aid in seeking for the formula which Boris had found. Then at last I dared call the doctor. He is a good man, and together we struggled to keep it from the public. Without him I never could have succeeded. At last we got the servants paid and sent away into the country, where old Rosier keeps them quiet with stones of Boris's and Genevieve's travels in distant lands, from whence they will not return from years. We buried Boris in the little cemetery of Savers. The doctor is a good creature and knows when to pity a man who can bear no more. He gave his certificate of heart disease and asked no questions of me. Then, lifting his head from his hands, he said, Open the letter, Alec. It is for us both. I tore it open. It was Boris's will, dated a year before. He left everything to Genevieve, and in case of her dying childless, I was to take control of the house in Rue St. Cecile, and Jack Scott, the management on our debts, the property reverted to his mother's family in Russia, with the exception of the sculptured marbles executed by himself. These he left to me. The page blurred under our eyes, and Jack got up and walked to the window. Presently he returned and sat down again. 
I dreaded to hear what he was going to say, but he spoke with the same simplicity and gentleness. Genevieve lies before the Madonna in the marble room. The Madonna bends tenderly above her, and Genevieve smiles back into that calm face that never would have been except for her. His voice broke, but he grasped my hand, saying, Courage, Alex. Next morning we left for Epp to fulfill his trust. The same evening I took the keys and went into the house I had known so well. Everything was in order, but the silence was terrible. Though I went twice to the door of the marble room, I could not force myself to enter. It was beyond my strength. I went into the smoking room and sat down before the spinet. A small lace handkerchief lay on the keys, and I turned away, choking. It was plain I could not stay, so I locked every door, every window, and three front and back gates, and went away. Next morning, Alcilde packed my valet, and leaving him in charge of my apartments, I took the Orient Express for Constantinople. During the two years that I wandered through Europe, at first in our letters we never mentioned Genevieve and Boris, but gradually their names crept in. I recollect particularly a passage in one of Jack's letters replying to one of mine. What you tell me of seeing Boris bending over you while you lay ill and feeling his touch on your face and hearing his voice, of course, troubles me. This that you describe must have happened a fortnight after he died. I say to myself that you were dreaming, that it was part of your delirium, but the explanation does not satisfy, nor would it you. Toward the end of the second year, a letter came from Jack to me in India, so unlike anything that I had ever known of him that I decided to return at once to Paris. He wrote, I am well and sell all my pictures as artists, do who do not have no need of money. I have not a care of my own, but I am more restless than if I had. I am unable to shake off the strange anxiety about you. It is not apprehension, it is rather a breathless expectancy of what God knows. I can only say it is wearing me out. Nights I dream always of you and Boris. I can never recall anything afterward. But I wake in the morning with my heart beating, and all day the excitement increases until I fall asleep at night to recall the same experience. I'm quite exhausted by it and have determined to break up this morbid condition. I must see you. Shall I go to Bombay, or will you come to Paris? I telegraphed him to expect me by the next steamer. When we met, I thought he had changed very little. I... He insisted, looked in splendid health. It was good to hear his voice again, and we sat and chatted about what life still held for us, and we felt that it was pleasant to be alive in the bright spring weather. We stayed in Paris together a week, and then I went for a week to Eft with him. But first of all, we went to the cemetery at Severs, where Boris lay. Shall we place the fates in the little grove above him? Jack asked, and I answered, I think only the Madonna should watch over Boris's grave. The Jack was none the better for my homecoming. The dreams of which he could not retain even the least definite outline continued, and he said that at times the sense of breathless expectancy was suffocating. You see, I do you harm and not good, I said. Try a change without me. So he started alone for a ramble, among the Channel Islands, and I went back to Paris. I have not yet entered Boris's house, now mine since my return, but I know it must be done. It had been kept in order by Jack. There were servants there, so I gave up my own apartment and went there to live. Indeed, of the agitation I had feared, I found myself able to paint there tranquilly. I visited all the rooms, all but one. I could not bring myself to enter the marble room where Genevieve lay. And yet I felt the longing, growing daily, to look upon her face, to kneel beside her. One April afternoon I lay dreaming in the smoking room, just as I had lain two years before, and mechanically I looked among the tawny eastern rugs for the wolf skin. 
At last I distinguished the pointed ears and flat, cruel head, and I thought of my dream where I saw Genevieve lying beside it. The helmet still hung against the threadbare tapestry. Among them the old Spanish Morian, which I remember Genevieve had once put on when we were amusing ourselves with the ancient bits of mail. I turned my eyes to the spinner. Every yellow key seemed eloquent of her caressing hand, and I rose, drawn by the strength of my life's passion, to the sealed door of the marble room. The heavy doors swung inward under my trembling hand. Sunlight poured through the window, tipping the gold, the wings of Cupid. It lingered like a nimbus over the brows of the Madonna. Her tender face bent in compassion over a marble form, so exquisitely pure that I knelt and signed myself. Genevieve lay in the shadow under the Madonna, and yet, through her white arms, I saw the pale azure vein, and beneath her softly clasped hands the folds of her dress were tinged with rose, as if from some faint warm light within her breast. Bending without a breaking heart, bending with a breaking heart, I touched the marble drapery with my lips, then crept back into the silent house. A maid came and brought me a letter, and I sat down in the little conservatory to read it, but as I was about to break the seal, seeing the girl linger, I asked her what she wanted. She stammered something about a white rabbit that had been caught in the house and asked what should be done with it. I told her to let it loose in the walled garden behind the house and open my letter. It was from Jack, but so incoherent that I thought he must have lost his reason. It was nothing but a series of prayers to me not to leave the house until he could get back. He could not tell me why. There were the dreams, he said. He could explain nothing, but he was sure that I must not leave the house in the Rue St. Cecile. As I finished reading, I raised my eyes and saw the same maidservant standing in the doorway holding a glass dish in which two goldfish were swimming. Put them back into the tank and tell me what you mean by interrupting me, I said. With a half-suppressed whimper, she emptied the jar and fish into an aquarium at the end of the conservatory and, turning to me, asked my permission to leave my service. She said people were playing tricks on her, evidently with the design of getting her into trouble. The marble rabbit had been stolen and a live one had been brought into the house. The two beautiful marble fish were gone. She had just found those common live things flopping on the dining room floor. I reassured her <clears throat> and sent her away, saying I would look about myself. I went into the studio. There was nothing there but my canvases and some casts, except the marble of the Easter lily. I saw it on a table across the room. Then I strode angrily over to it, but the flower I lifted from the table was fresh and fragile and filled the air with perfume. Then suddenly I comprehended and sprang through the hallway to the marble room. The doors flew open. The sunlight streamed into my face and through it, in heavenly glory, the Madonna smiled as Genevieve lifted her flushed face from her marble couch and opened her sleepy eyes. The Court of the Dragon O thou who burnst in heart for those who burn in hell, whose fires thyself shall feed in turn. How long be crying mercy on them, God? Why, who art thou to teach and he to learn? In the church of St. Barnaby, vespers were over. The clergy left the altar and little choir boys flocked across the chancel and settled into the stalls. A Swiss in rich uniform, marched down the south aisle, sounding his staff at every fourth step on the stone pavement. Behind him came that eloquent preacher and good man. My chair was near the chancel rail. I now turned toward the west end of the church. The other people between the altar and the pulpit turned too. There was a little scraping and rustling while the congregation seated itself again. The preacher mounted the pulpit stairs, and the organ voluntarily ceased. 
I'd always found the organ playing at St. Barnaby highly interesting, learned and scientific it was, too much so for my small knowledge, but expressing a vivid if cold intelligence. Moreover, it possessed the French quality of taste. Taste reigned supreme, self-controlled, dignified, and reticent. Today, however, from the first chord, I had felt the change for the worst. A sinister change. During Vespers, it had been chiefly the chancel organ which supported the beautiful choir, but now and again, quite wantonly, as it seemed, from the West Gallery, where the great organ stands, a heavy hand had struck across the church at the serene peace of those clear voices. It was something more than harsh and dissonant, and it betrayed no lack of skill. As it reoccurred again and again, it set me thinking of what my architect's books say about the custom in early times to consecrate the choir as soon as it was built, and that the nave, being finished sometimes half a century later, often did not get any blessing at all. I wondered idly if that had been the case at St. Barnaby, and whether something not usually supposed to be at home in a Christian church might have entered undetected and taken possession of the West Gallery. I read of such things happening, too, but not in works on architecture. Then I remembered that St. Barnaby was not much more than a hundred years old and smiled at the incongruous association of medieval superstitions with that cheerful little piece of 18th century Rococo. But now Vespers were over, and there should have followed a few quiet chords fit to accompany meditation while we waited for the sermon. Instead of that, the discord at the lower end of the church broke out with the departure of the clergy as if now nothing could control it. I belong to those children of an older and simpler generation who do not love to seek for physiological subtleties in art, and I have ever refused to find in music anything more than melody and harmony, but I felt that in the labyrinth of sounds now issuing from that instrument there was something being hunted. Up and down the pedals chased him while the manuals blared approval. Poor devil! Whoever he was, there seemed small hope of escape. My nervous annoyance changed to anger. Who was doing this? How dare he play like that in the midst of divine service? I glanced at the people near me. Not one appeared to be in the least disturbed. The placid brows of the kneeling nuns, still turned towards the altar, lost none of their devoted abstraction under the pale shadow of their white headdress. The fashionable lady beside me was looking expectantly at Monsieur Monsignor, for all her face betrayed the organ might have been singing an Ave Maria. But now at last the preacher made the sign of the cross and commanded silence. I turned to him gladly. Thus far I had not found the rest I had counted on when I entered St. Barnaby that afternoon. I was worn out. By three nights of physical suffering and mental trouble, the last had been the worst, and it was an exhausted body and a mind benumbed and yet acutely sensitive, which I had brought to my favorite church for healing, where I had been reading The King in Yellow. The sun ariseth, they gather themselves together, and lay them down in their dens. He delivered his text in a calm voice, glancing quietly over the congregation. My eyes turned, I knew not why, toward the lower end of the church. The organist was coming from behind his pipes and passing along the gallery on his way out. I saw him disappear by a small door that leads to some stairs which descend directly to the street. He was a slender man, and his face was as white as his coat was black. Good riddance, I thought, with your wicked music. I hope your assistant will play the closing voluntary. With a feeling of relief, with a deep, calm feeling of relief, I turned back to the mild face of the pulpit and settled myself to listen. Here, at last, was the ease of mind I longed for. My children, said the preacher, one truth the human soul finds hardest of all to learn, that it has nothing to fear. It can never be made to see that nothing can really harm it. Curious doctrine, I thought, for a Catholic priest. Let us see how he will reconcile that with the fathers. 
Nothing can really harm the soul, he went on in his coolest, clearest tones, because... But I never heard the rest. My eye left his face, I knew not for what reason, and sought the lower end of the church. The same man was coming out from behind the organ and was passing along the gallery the same way, and there had not been time for him to return, and if he had returned I must have seen him. I felt a faint chill, and my heart sank, and yet, his going and coming were no affair of mine. I looked at him. I could not look away from his black figure and his white face. When he was exactly opposite to me, he turned and sat across the church, straight into my eyes. A look of hate, intense and deadly. I have never seen any other like it. Would to God I might never see it again. Then he disappeared by the same door through which I had watched him depart less than sixty seconds before. I sat and tried to collect my thoughts. My first sensation was like that of a very young child badly hurt when it catches its breath before crying out. I suddenly find myself the object of such hatred and exquisitely painful. This man was an utter stranger. Why should he hate me so, me whom he had never seen before? For the moment all other sensation was merged in this one pang. Even fear was subordinate to grief. And for that moment I never doubted, but in the next I began to reason and the sense of the incongruous came to my aid. As I have said, St. Barnaby is a modern church. It is small and well lighted. One sees all over it almost at a glance. The organ gallery gets a strong white light from a long row of long windows in the clerestory, which have not even colored glass. The pulpit being in the middle of the church, it follows that when I was turned toward it, whatever moved at the west end could not fail to attract my eye. When the organist passed, it was no wonder that I saw him. I'd simply miscalculated the interval between his first and second passing. He'd come in that last time by the other side door and asked for the look which had so upset me. There had been no such thing, and I was a nervous fool. I looked about. This was a likely place to harbor supernatural horrors. That clear-cut, reasonable face of the pastor, his collected manner and easy, graceful gestures, were they not just a little discouraging to the notion of a gruesome mystery? I glanced above his head and almost laughed. That flyaway lady supporting one corner of the pulpit canopy, which looked like a fringed damask tablecloth in a high wind, at the first attempt of a basilisk to pose up there in the organ loft, she would point her gold trumpet at him and puff him out of existence. I laughed to myself over this conceit, which at the time I thought very amusing, and sat and chafed myself everything else from that old harpy outside the railing who had made me pay ten cent times for my chair before she would let me in. She was more like a basilisk, I told myself, than was my organist with the anema complexion. From that grim old dame to yes, lass, the pastor himself, for all devoteness had fled. I had never yet done such a thing in my life, but now I felt the desire to mock. As for the sermon, I could not hear a word of it, for the jingle in my ears of the skirts of St. Paul has reached, having preached us those six lectures more unctuous than ever he preached, keeping time to the most fantastic and irreverent thoughts. It was no use to sit there any longer. I must get out of doors to shake myself free of this hateful mood. I knew the rudeness I was committing, but still I rose and left the church. A spring sun was shining on the Rue St. Honor, and I ran down the church steps. On one corner stood a barrel full of yellow jonquils, pale violets from the Riviera, dark Russian violets and white Roman hyacinths, and a gold cloud of mimosa. The street was full of Sunday pleasure-seekers. I swung my cane and laughed with the rest. Someone overtook and passed me. He never turned, but there was the same deadly malignity in his white profile that there had been in his eyes. I watched him as long as I could see him. His lithe back expressed the same menace. 
Every step that carried him away from me seemed to bear him on some errand connected with my destruction. I was creeping along, my feet almost refusing to move. There began to dawn in me a sense of responsibility for something long forgotten. It began to seem as if I deserved that which he threatened. It reached a long way back, a long, long way back. It had lain dormant all these years. It was there, though, and presently it would rise and confront me. But I would try to escape, and I stumbled as best as I could into the Rue de Rivioli, across the place to La Concorde, and on to the choir. I looked with sick eyes upon the sun, shining through the white foam of the fountain, pouring over the backs of the dusky bronze river gods and the faraway arc, the structure of amethyst mist on the countless vistas of gray stems and bare branches, faintly green. Then I saw him again coming down one of the chestnut alleys of the Cor Lorraine, I left the riverside, plunged blindly across to the Champs Elysees, and turned toward the Arc. The setting sun was sending its rays along the green sward of the Rond Point. In the full glow, he sat on a beach, a bench, children and young mothers all about him. He was nothing but a Sunday lounger like the others, like myself. I said the words almost aloud, and all the while I gazed on the malignant hatred of his face. But he was not looking at me. I crept past and dragged my leaden feet up the avenue. I knew that every time I met him, brought him nearer to the accomplishment of his purpose and my fate, and still I tried to save myself. The last rays of sunset were pouring through the great arc. I passed under it and met him face to face. I left him far down the Champs Elysees, and yet he came in with a stream of people who were returning from the Bois de Boulogne. He came so close that he brushed me. His slender fame felt like iron inside its loose black covering. He showed no signs of haste, nor of fatigue, nor of any human feeling. His whole being expressed one thing, the will and the power to work me evil. In anguish I watched him where he went down the broad, crowded avenue that was all flashing with wheels and the trappings of horses and the helmets of the guard Republicain. He was soon lost to sight, then I turned and fled into the boy far out beyond it. I know not where I went, but after a long while, as it seemed to me, night had fallen, and I found myself sitting at a table before a small cafe. I wandered back into the boy. It was hours now since I had seen him. Physical fatigue and mental suffering had left me no power to think or feel. I was tired, so tired. I longed to hide away in my own den. I resolved to go home, but that was a long way off. I live in the court of the dragon, a narrow passage that leads from the Rue de Rennes to the Rue de Dragon. It is an impasse, traversable only for foot passengers. Over the entrance on the Rue de Rennes is a balcony supported by an iron dragon. Within the court, tall old houses rise on either side and close the ends to give on the two streets. Huge gates, swung back during the day into the walls of the deep archways, closed this court after midnight, and one must enter then by ringing at certain small doors inside. The sunken pavement collects unsavory pools, steep stairways pitch down to doors that open on the court. The ground floors are occupied by shops of second-hand dealers and by iron workers. All day long the place rings with the clink of hammers and the clang of metal bars. Unsavory as it is below, there is cheerfulness and comfort and hard, honest work above. Five flights up are the anteliers of architects and painters and the hiding places <clears throat> of middle-aged students like myself who want to live alone. When I first came here to live, I was young and not alone. I tried to walk a while before any conveyance appeared, but at last... When I had almost reached the Arc de Triomphe again, an empty cab came along and I took it. From the Arc to the Rue du Rennes is a drive of more than half an hour, especially when one is conveyed by a tired cab force that has been at the mercy of Sunday fete makers. There had been time before I passed under the dragon's wings, 
to meet my enemy over and over again, but I never saw him once, and now refuge was close at hand. Before the wide gateway, a small mob of children were playing. Our concierge and his wife walked among them with their black poodle, keeping order. Some couples were waltzing on the sidewalk. I returned their greetings and hurried in. All the inhabitants of the court had trooped out into the street. The place was quite deserted, lighted by a few lanterns hung high up in which the gas burned dimly. My apartment was at the top of the house, halfway down the court, reached by a staircase that descended almost into the street, with only a bit of passageway intervening. I set my foot on the threshold of the open door. The friendly old ruinous stair rose before me, leading up to rest and shelter. Looking back over my right shoulder, I saw him, ten paces off. He must have entered the court with me. He was coming straight on, neither slowly nor swiftly, but straight on to me, and now he was looking at me. For the first time since our eyes encountered across the church, they met now again, and I knew that the time had come. Retreating backward down the court, I faced him. I meant to escape by the entrance of the Rue de Dragon. His eyes told me that I should never escape. It seemed ages while we were going, I retreating, he advancing down the court in perfect silence, but at last I felt the shadow of the archway, and the next step brought me within it. I meant to turn here and spring through into the street, but the shadow was not that of an archway, it was that of a vault. The great doors on the Rue de Dragon were closed. I felt this by the blackness which surrounded me, and at the same instant I read it in his face. How his face gleamed in the darkness, drawing swiftly nearer. The deep vaults, the huge closed doors, their cold iron clamps were all on his side. The thing which he had threatened had arrived. It gathered and bore me down on me from the fathomless shadows. The point from which it would strike was his infernal eyes. Hopeless, I set my back against the barred doors and defied him. There was a scraping of chairs on the stone floor and a rustling as the congregation rose. I could hear the Swiss staff in the south aisle preceding the pastor to the sacristy. The kneeling nuns, roused from their devout abstraction, made their reverence and went away. The fashionable lady, my neighbor, rose also with grateful reserve. As she departed, her glance just flitted over my face in disapproval. Half dead, or so it seemed to me, yet intensely alive to every trifle. I sat among the leisurely moving crowd, and then rose too and went toward the door. I'd slept through the sermon. Had I slept through the sermon? I looked up and saw him passing along the gallery to his place. Only his side I saw, the thin bent arm in its black covering, looked like one of those devilish, nameless instruments which lie in the disused torture chambers of medieval castles. But I had escaped him, though his eyes had said I should not. Had I escaped him, that which gave him the power over me came back out of oblivion where I had hoped to keep it, for I knew him now, death in the awful abode of lost souls, whither my weakness long ago had sent him. They had changed him for every other eye, but not for mine. I had recognized him almost from the first. I had never doubted what he was come to do, and now I knew while my body sat safe in the cheerful little church, he had been hunting my soul in the court of the dragon. I crept to the door. The organ broke out overhead with a blare. A dazzling light filled the church, blotting the altar from my eyes. The people faded away, the arches, the vaulted roof vanished. I raised my seared eyes to the fathomless glare, and I saw the black stars hanging in the heavens, and the wet winds from the lake of Hali chilled my face. And now far away, over leagues of tossing cloud waves, I saw the moon dripping with spray, and beyond, the towers of Carcosa rose behind the moon. Death in the awful abode of lost souls, whither my weakness long ago had sent him, had changed him for every other eye but mine, and now I heard his voice rise and swell and thundering through the flaring light, and as I fell, 
the radiance increasing, increasing poured over me in waves of flame, then I sank into the depths. And I heard the king in yellow, whispering to my soul, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The Yellow Sign Let the red dawn surmise what we shall do when this blue starlight dies and all is through. 1. There are so many things which are impossible to explain. Why should certain chords in music make me think of the brown and gold tints of autumn foliage? Why should the mass of St. Cecil bend my thoughts wandering among caverns whose walls blaze with ragged masses of virgin silver? What was it in the roar and turmoil of Broadway at six o'clock that flashed before my eyes the picture of a still Brenton forest where sunlight filtered through spring foliage and Sylvia bent half curiously, half tenderly over a small green lizard murmuring to think that this also is a little ward of God. When I first saw the watchman, his back was toward me. I looked at him indifferently until he went into the church. I paid no more attention to him than I had to any other man who lounged through Washington Square that morning, and when I shut my window and turned back into my studio, I had forgotten him. Late in the afternoon, the day being warm, I raised the window again and leaned out to get a snip fair. A man was standing in the courtyard of the church, and I noticed him again with as little interest as I had that morning. I looked across the square to where the fountain was playing, and then, with my mind filled with vague impressions of trees, asphalt drives, and the moving groups of nursemaids and holiday makers, I started to walk back to my easel. As I turned, by listless grace included the man below in the churchyard. His face was toward me now, and with a perfectly involuntary movement, I bent to see it. At the same moment, he raised his head and looked at me. Instantly I thought of a coffin worm. Whatever it was about the man that repelled me, I did not know, but the impression of a plump white grave worm was so intense and nauseating that I must have shown it in my expression. For he turned his puffy face away with a movement which made me think of a disturbed grub and a chestnut. I went back to my easel and motioned the model to resume her pose. After working a while, I was satisfied that I was spoiling what I had done as rapidly as possible and took up a palette knife and scraped the color out again. The flesh tones were sallow and unhealthy, and I did not understand how I could have painted such sickly color into a study which before that had glowed with healthy tones. I looked at Tessie. She had not changed, and the clear flush of health dyed her neck and cheeks as I frowned. Is it something I've done, she said. No, I've made a mess of this arm, and for the life of me I can't see how I come to paint such mud as that into the canvas, I replied. Don't I pose well, she insisted. Of course, perfectly. Then it's not my fault? No, it's my own. I'm very sorry, she said. I told her she could rest while I applied rag and turpentine to the spot on my canvas, and she went off to smoke a cigarette and look over the illustrations in the Courier Francais. I did not know whether it was something in the turpentine or a defect in the canvas, but the more I scrubbed, the more that gangrene seemed to spread. You know, I worked like a beaver to get it out, and yet the disease appeared to creep from limb to limb of the study before me, Alarmed, I strove to arrest it, but now the color on the breast changed, and the whole figure seemed to absorb the infection as a sponge soaks up water. Vigorously, I applied palette knife, turpentine, and scraper, thinking all the time, what a sense. I should hold with Duval, who had sold me the canvas, but soon I noticed that it was not the canvas which was defective, nor yet the colors of Edward. It must be the turpentine, I thought angrily, or else my eyes have become so blurred and confused by the afternoon light that I can't see straight. I called Tessie the model. She came and leaned over my chair, blowing rings of smoke into the air. What have you been doing to it? she exclaimed. 
Nothing, I growled. It must be this turpentine. What a horrible color it is now, she continued. Do you think my flesh resembles green cheese? No, I don't, I said angrily. Did you ever know me to paint like that before? No, indeed. Well, then, it must be the turpentine or something, she admitted. She slipped on a Japanese robe and walked to the window. I scraped and rubbed until I was tired, finally picked up my brushes and hurled them through the canvas with a forcible expression, the tone alone of which reached Tessie's ears. Nevertheless, she promptly began, That's it. Swear and act silly and ruin your brushes. You have been three weeks on that study, and now look. What's the good of ripping the canvas? What creatures artists are? I felt about as much ashamed as I usually did after such an outbreak, and I turned the ruined canvas to the wall. Tessie helped me clean my brushes and then danced away to dress. From the screen she regaled me with bits of advice concerning whole or partial loss of temper until, thinking perhaps I had been tormented sufficiently, she came out to implore me to button her waist where she could not reach it on the shoulder. Everything went wrong from the time you came back from the window and talked about that horrid-looking man you saw in the churchyard, she announced. Yes, he probably bewitched the picture, I said, yawning. I looked at my watch. It's after six, I know, said Tessie, adjusting her hat before the mirror. Yes, I replied. I didn't mean to keep you so long. I leaned out of the window but recoiled with disgust, for the young man with the pasty face stood below the churchyard. Tessie saw my gesture of disapproval and leaned from the window. Is that the man you don't like? she whispered. I nodded. I can't see his face, but he does look fat and soft some way or other, she continued, turning to look at me. He reminds me of a dream, an awful dream I once had, or, she mused, looking down at her shapely shoes. Was it a dream after all? How should I know? I smiled. Tessie smiled in reply. You were in it, she said, so perhaps you might know something about it. Tessie, Tessie, I protested, don't you dare flatter by saying that you dream about me. But I did, she insisted. Shall I tell you about it? Go ahead, I replied, lighting a cigarette. Tessie leaned back on the open window sill and began very seriously. One night, last winter, I was lying in bed, thinking about nothing at all. In particular, I had been posing for you, and I was tired out. Yet it seemed impossible for me to sleep. I heard the bells in the city ring ten, eleven, and midnight. I must have fallen asleep about midnight, because I don't remember hearing the bells after that. It seemed to me that I had scarcely closed my eyes when I dreamed that something impelled me to go to the window. I rose and raised the sash, leaning out. Twenty-fifth Street was deserted as far as I could see. I began to be afraid. Everything outside seemed so so black and uncomfortable. Then the sound of wheels in the distance came to my ears, and it seemed to me as though that was what I must wait for. Very slowly the wheels approached, and finally I could make out a vehicle moving along the street. It came nearer and nearer, and when it passed beneath my window I saw it was a hearse. Then as I trembled with fear, the driver turned and looked straight at me. When I awoke, I was standing by the open window, shivering with cold, but the black plumed hearse and the driver were gone. I dreamed this dream again in March last, and again awoke beside the open window. Last night, the dream came again. You remember how it was raining when I awoke, standing at the open window. My nightdress was soaked. But where did I come into the dream? I asked. You, you were in the coffin, but you were not dead. In the coffin? Yes. How did you know? Could you see me? No, I only knew you were there. Had you been eating Welsh rare bits or lobster salad? I began laughing, but the girl interrupted me with a frightened cry. Hello, what's up? I said as she shrank into the embrasure by the window. The, the man in the churchyard, he drove the hearse. Nonsense, I said. But Tessie's eyes were wide with terror. I went to the window and looked out. 
The man was gone. Come, Tessie, I urged. Don't be foolish. You have posed too long. You are nervous. Do you think I could forget that face? She murmured. Three times I saw the purse pass below my window, and every time the driver turned and looked up at me. Oh, his face was so white and, and soft. It looked dead. It looked as if it had been dead a long time. I induced the girl to sit down and swallow a glass of marsala. Then I sat down beside her and tried to give her some advice. Look here, Tessie, I said. You go to the country for a week or two, and you'll have no more dreams about hearses. You pose all day, and when night comes, your nerves are upset. You can't keep this up. Then again, instead of going to bed when your day's work is done, you run off to picnics at Salzer's Park or go to the El Dorado or Coney Island. And when you come down here next morning, you're fagged out. There was no real hearse. There was a soft-shell crab dream. She smiled faintly. What about the man in the churchyard? Oh, he's only an ordinary, unhealthy, everyday creature. As true as my name is Tessie Reardon, I swear to you, Mr. Scott, that the face of the man below in the churchyard is the face of the man who drove the hearse. What of it? I said. It's an honest trade. Then you think I did see the hearse. Oh, I said diplomatically. If you really did, it might not be unlikely that the man below drove it. There is nothing in that. Tessie rolled. Tessie Rose unrolled her scented handkerchief, and taking a bit of gum from a knot in the hem, placed it in her mouth. The drawing on her gloves, she offered me her hand with a frank, Good night, Mr. Scott, and walked out. 2. The next morning, Thomas, the bellboy, brought me the herald and a bit of news. The church next door had been sold. I thanked heaven for it, not being a Catholic, I had any repugnance for the congregation next door, but because my nerves were shattered by a blatant exhorter, whose every word echoed through the aisle of the church as if it had been my own rooms, and who insisted on his R's with a nasal persistence, which revolted my every instinct. Then, too, there was a fiend in human shape, an organist, who reeled off some of the grand old hymns with an interpretation of his own, and I longed for the blood of a creature who could play the doxology with an amendment of minor chords, which one hears only in the quartet of very young undergraduates. I believe the minister was a good man, but when he bellowed, And the Lord said unto Moses, The Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. My wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword. I wondered how many centuries of purgatory it would take to atone for such a sin. Who bought the property? I asked Thomas. Nobody that I know, sir. They do say the gent what owns this here Hamilton Flats was looking at it. He might be a building more studios. I walked to the window. The young man with the unhealthy face stood by the churchyard gate, and at the mere sight of him the same overwhelming repugnance took possession of me. By the way, Thomas, I said, who is that fellow down there? Thomas sniffed. That there warm, sir, as night watchman of the church, sir, he makes me tired of sitting out all night on them steps and looking at you insulting like. I'd have punched his if. Sir, beg pardon, sir. Go on, Thomas. One night I coming home with Harry, the other English boy, I sees him sitting there on them steps. We had Molly and Jen with us, sir, the two girls on the tray service, and he looked so insulting at us that I up and says, what are you looking at, you fat slug? Beg pardon, sir, but that's how I says, sir, that he don't say nothing, and I says, come out and I'll punch and put him head. Then I opens the gate and goes in, but he don't say nothing, only looks insulting like. Then I hits him one, but ug, his head. Was that cold and mushy, it is sucking you to touch him. What did he do then? I asked curiously. Him? Nothing. And you, Thomas? The young man flushed with embarrassment and smiled uneasily. Mr. Scott, sir, I ain't no coward, and I can't make out at all why I run. I was in the fifth launcher, sir, 
Bugler, Abdel Kabir, was shot by the wells. You don't mean to say you ran away? Yes, sir, I run. Why? That's just what I don't know, sir. I grabbed Molly and run, and the rest was as frightened as I. But what were they frightened at? Thomas refused to answer for a while, but now my curiosity was aroused about the repulsive young man below, and I pressed him. Three years' sojourn in America had not only modified Thomas's cockney dialect, but had given him the American's fear of ridicule. You won't believe me, Mr. Scott, sir. Yes, I will. You'll laugh at me, sir. Nonsense. He hesitated. Well, sir, it's God's truth that when it am he grabbed me wrist, sir, and when I was twisted his soft, mushy fist, one of his fingers came off in the end. The utter loathing and horror of Thomas's face must have been reflected in my own, for he added, It's awful now. I see him, I just goes away, he makes me ill. When Thomas had gone, I went to the window. The man stood beside the church railing with both hands on the gate, but I hastily retreated to my easel again, sickened and horrified, for I saw that the middle finger of his right hand was missing. At nine o'clock, Tessie appeared and vanished behind the screen with a merry, Good morning, Mr. Scott. When she had reappeared and taken her pose upon the model stand, I started a new canvas, much to her delight. She remained silent as long as I was on that drawing, but as soon as the scrape of the charcoal ceased and I took up my fixative, she began to chatter. Oh, I had such a lovely time last night, sir. We went to Tony Pastor's. Who are we? I demanded. Oh, Maggie, you know, Mr. White's model and Pink McCormick. We call her Pink because she's got the beautiful red hair you artists like so much. And Lizzie Burke. I sent the shower spray from the fixative over the canvas and said, Well, go on. We saw Kelly and Baby Barnes, the skirt dancer, and, and all the rest. I made a mash. Then you have gone back on me, Tessie. She laughed and shook her head. He's Lizzie Burke's brother, Ed. He's a perfect gentleman. I felt constrained to give her some parental advice concerning mashing when she took him, when she took with a bright smile. Oh, I can take care of a strange mash, she said, examining her chewing gum. But Ed is different. Lizzie is my best friend. Then she related how Ed had come back from the stocking mill in Lowell, Massachusetts, to find her and Lizzie grown up. And what an accomplished young man he was, and how he thought nothing of squandering half a dollar for ice cream and oysters to celebrate his entry as a clerk into the woolen department of Macy's. Before she finished, I began to paint, and she resumed the pose, smiling and chattering like a sparrow. By noon, I had the study fairly well rubbed in, and Tessie came to look at it. That's better, she said. I thought so, too, and ate my lunch with a satisfied feeling that all was going well. Tessie spread her lunch on a drawing table opposite me, and we drank our claret from the same bottle and lighted our cigarettes from the same match. I was very much attached to Tessie. I'd watched her shoot up into a slender but exquisitely formed woman from a frail, awkward child. She had posed for me during the last three years, and among all my models, she was my favorite. It would have troubled me very much indeed had she become tough or fly, as the phrase goes, but... I never noticed any deterioration of her manners and felt at heart that she was all right. She and I never discussed morals at all. I had no intention of doing so, partly because I had none myself and partly because I knew she would do what she liked in spite of me. Still, I did hope she would steer clear of complications because I wished her well, and then also I had a selfish desire to retain the best model I had. I knew that bashing, as she termed it, had no significance with girls like Tessie and that such things in America did not resemble in the least the same things in Paris. Yet having lived with my eyes open, I also knew that somebody would take Tessie away some day in one manner or another, and though I professed to myself that marriage was nonsense, I sincerely hoped that, in this case, there would be a priest at the end of the vista. I'm a Catholic. But I listen to high mass when I sign myself. I feel that everything, including myself, is more cheerful. 
and when I confess, it does me good. A man who lives as much alone as I do must confess to somebody. Then again, Sylvia was Catholic, and it was reason enough for me. But I was speaking of Tessie, which is very different. Tessie also was Catholic, and much more devout than I, so taking it all in all, I had little fear for my pretty model until she should fall in love, but then I knew that fate alone would decide her future for her, and I prayed inwardly that fate would keep her away from men like me and throw into her path nothing but Ed Burke's and Jimmy McCormick's. Bless her sweet face. Tessie sat blowing rings of smoke up to the ceiling and tickling the ice in her tumbler. Do you know that I also had a dream last night, I observed. Not about that man, she laughed. Exactly. A dream, similar to yours, only much worse. It was foolish and thoughtless of me to say this, but you know how little tact the average painter has. I must have fallen asleep about ten o'clock, I continued, and after a while I dreamt that I awoke. So plainly did I hear the midnight bells, the wind in the tree branches, and the whistle of a steamer from the bay, that even now I scarcely believe I was not awake. I seemed to be lying in a box which had a glass cover. Dimly I saw the street lamps pass, for I must tell you, Tessie, the box in which I reclined appeared to lie in a cushioned wagon, which jolted me over stony pavement. After a while I became impatient and tried to move, but the box was too narrow. My hands were crossed on my breast, so I could not raise them to help myself. I listened and then tried to call. My voice was gone. I could hear the trample of the horses attached to the wagon and even the breathing of the driver. Then another sound broke upon my ears like the raising of a window sash. I managed to turn my head a little and found I could look not only through the glass cover of my box but also through the glass panes in the side of the covered vehicle. I saw houses, empty and silent, with neither light nor life about any of them except in one. In that house a window was open on the first floor, and a figure, all in white, stood looking down into the street. It was you. Tessie had turned her face away from me and leaned on the table with her elbow. I could see your face, I resumed, and it seemed to me to be very sorrowful. Then we passed on and turned into a narrow black lane. Presently the horses stopped. I waited and waited, closing my eyes with ear and impatience, but all was silent as the grave after what seemed to me hours. I began to feel uncomfortable. A sense that somebody was close to me made me unclose my eyes. Then I saw the white face of the hearse driver looking at me through the coffin lid. A sob from Tessie interrupted me. She was trembling like a leaf. I saw I had made an ass of myself and attempted to repair the damage. Why, Tessie, I said, I only told you this to show you what influence your story might have on another person's dreams. You don't suppose I really lay in a coffin, do you? What are you trembling for? Don't you see that your dream and my unreasonable dislike for that inoffensive watchman of the church simply set my brain working? As soon as I fell asleep, she laid her head between my arms. She sobbed as if her heart would break. What a precious triple donkey I had made of myself. But I was about to break my record. I put my arm around her. Tessie, dear, forgive me, I said. I have no business to frighten you with such nonsense. You are too sensible a girl, too good a Catholic to believe in dreams. Her hand tightened on mine and her head fell back upon my shoulder. But she still trembled and I petted her and comforted her. Come, Tessie, open your eyes and smile. Her eyes opened with a slow, languid movement and met mine, but their expression was so queer that I hastened to reassure her again. It's all humbug, Tessie. You're surely not afraid that any harm will come to you because of that. No, she said, but her scarlet lips quivered. Then what's the matter? Are you afraid? Yes, not for myself. For me, then, I demanded gaily. For you she murmured in a voice almost inaudible. I care for you. At first I started to laugh, but when I understood her, a shock passed through me, and I sat like one turned to stone. 
This was the crowning bit of idiocy I had committed. During the moment which elapsed between her reply and my answer, I thought of a thousand responses to that innocent confession. I could pass it by with a laugh. I could misunderstand her and assure her as to my health. I could simply point out that it was impossible she could love me. But my reply was quicker than my thoughts, and I might think and think now when it was too late, for I had kissed her on the mouth. That evening I took my usual walk in Washington Park, pondering over the occurrences of the day. I was thoroughly committed. There was no back out now, and I stared the future straight in the face. I was not good, not even scrupulous, but I had no idea of deceiving either myself or Tessie. The one passion of my life lay buried in the sunlit forests of Brittany. Was it buried forever? Hope cried no. For three years I had been listening to the voice of hope, and for three years I had waited for a footstep on my threshold. Had Sylvia forgotten? No, cried hope. I said that I was no good. That is true, but still I was not exactly a comic opera villain. I had led an easy-going, reckless life, taking what invited me a pleasure, deploring and sometimes bitterly regretting the consequences. In one thing alone, except my painting, was I serious, and that was something which lay hidden, if not lost, in the Breton forests. It was too late for me to regret what had occurred during that day. Whatever it had been, pity, a sudden tenderness for sorrow, or the more brutal instinct of gratified vanity, it was all the same now, and unless I wished to bruise an innocent heart, my path lay marked before me. The fire and strength, the depth of passion of a love which I had never even suspected with all my imagined experience in the world, left me no alternative but to respond or send her away whether because I am so cowardly about giving pain to others, or whether it was that I have too little of the gloomy Puritan in me, I do not know, but I shrank from disclaiming responsibility for that thoughtless kiss, and in fact had no time to do so before the gates of her heart opened and the flood poured forth. Others who habitually do their duty and find a sullen satisfaction in making themselves and everybody else happy might have withstood it, I did not. I dared not. After the storm had abated, I did tell her that she might better have loved Ed Burke and worn a plain gold ring, but she would not hear of it. And I thought perhaps as long as she had decided to love somebody she could not marry, it had better be me. I, at least, could treat her with an intelligent affection, and whenever she became tired of her infatuation, she could go none the worse for it. For I was decided on the point Although I knew how hard it would be, I remembered the usual termination of platonic liaisons and thought how disgusted I had been whenever I heard of one. I knew I was undertaking a great deal for so unscrupulous a man as I was, and I dreamed the future. But never, for one moment, did I doubt that she was safe with me. Had it been anybody but Tessie, I should not have bothered my head about scruples, for it did not occur to me to sacrifice Tessie as I would have sacrificed a woman of the world. I looked the future squarely in the face and saw the several probable endings to the affair. She would either tire of the whole thing or become so unhappy that I should have either to marry her or go away. If I married her, we would be unhappy. I with a wife unsuited to me, and she with a husband unsuitable for any woman, for my past life could scarcely entitle me to marry. If I went away, she might either fall ill, recover, and marry some Eddie Burt, or she might recklessly or deliberately go and do something foolish. On the other hand, if she tired of me, then her whole life would be before her, with beautiful vistas of Eddie Burks and marriage rings and twins and Harlem Flats, and heaven knows what, as I strolled along through the trees by the Washington Arch, I decided that she should find a suitable friend in me anyway, and the future could take care of itself. Then I went into the house and put on my evening dress, for the little faintly perfumed note on my dresser said, Have a cab at the stage door at eleven, and the note was signed, Edith Carmichael. Metropolitan Theater. I took supper that night, or rather, we took supper, Miss Carmichael and I, at Solari's, and the dawn was just beginning to gild the cross in the memorial church as I entered Washington Square, after leaving Edith at the Brunswick. 
There was not a soul in the park as I passed along the trees and took the walk which leads from the Garibaldi statue to the Hamilton apartment house, but as I passed the churchyard I saw a figure sitting on the stone steps. In spite of myself, a chill crept over me at the sight of the puffy white face, and I hastened to pass. Then he said something which might have been addressed to me, or might merely have been a mutter to himself, but a sudden furious anger flamed up within me that such a creature should address me. For an instant I felt like wheeling about and smashing my stick over his head, but I walked on, and entering the Hamilton, went to my apartment. For some time I tossed about the bed, trying to get the sound of his voice out of my ears, but could not. It filled my head with a muttering sound, a thick, oily smoke from a fat rendering vat, or an odor of noisome decay, and as I lay and tossed about, the voice in my ears seemed more distinct, and I began to understand the words he had muttered. They came to me slowly as if I had forgotten them, and at last I could make some sense out of the sounds. It was this. Have you found the yellow sign? Have you found the yellow sign? Have you found the yellow sign? I was furious. What did he mean by that? Then with a curse upon him and his, I rolled over and went to sleep. But when I woke later, I looked pale and haggard, for I had dreamed the dream of the night before, and it troubled me more than I cared to think. I dressed and went into my studio. Tessie sat by the window, but as I came in, she rose and put both arms around my neck for an innocent kiss. She looked so sweet and dainty that I kissed her again and then sat down before the easel. Hello, where's the study I began yesterday, I asked. Tessie looked conscious, but did not answer. I began to hunt among the piles of canvases, saying, Hurry up, Tess, and get ready. We must take advantage of the morning light. When at last I gave up the search among the other canvases and turned to look around the room for the missing study, I noticed Tessie standing by the screen with her clothes on. What's the matter? I asked. Don't you feel well? Yes. Then hurry. Do you want me to pose as, as I have always posed? Then I understood. It was a new complication. I had lost, of course, the best model I had ever seen. I looked at Tessie. Her face was scarlet. Alas, alas, we had eaten of the tree of knowledge, and Eden and native innocence were dreams of the past. I mean, for her. I suppose she noticed the disappointment on my face, for she said, I will pose if you wish. The study is behind the screen here, where I put it. No, I said, we will begin something new. And I went into my wardrobe and picked out a Moorish costume, which fairly blazed with tinsel. It was a genuine costume, and Tessie retired to the screen with it, enchanted. When she came forth again, I was astonished. Her long black hair was bound above her head with a circlet of turquoises, and the ends curled about her glittering girdle. Her feet were encased in the embroidered pointed slippers, and the skirt of her costume, curiously wrought with arabesques and silver, fell to her ankles. The deep metallic blue vest embroidered with silver and the short moresque jacket spangled and sewn with turquoises became her wonderfully. She came up to me and held up her face smiling. I slipped my hand into my pocket and drawing out a gold chain with a cross attached, dropped it over her head. It's yours, Tessie. Mine? She faltered. Yours. Now go and pose. Then, with a radiant smile, she ran behind the screen and presently reappeared with a little box on which was written my name. I had intended to give it to you when I went home tonight, she said. But I can't wait now. I opened the box. On the pink cotton inside lay a clasp of black onyx on which was inlaid a curious symbol or letter in gold. It was neither Arabic nor Chinese nor, as I found afterward, did it belong to any human script? It's all I had to give you for a keepsake, she said timidly. I was annoyed, but I told her how much I should prize it, and promised to wear it always. She fastened it on my coat beneath the lapel. How foolish, Tess, to go and buy me such a beautiful thing as this, I said. 
I did not buy it, she laughed. Where did you get it? Then she told me how she found it one day while coming home from the aquarium in the battery, how she had advertised it and watched the papers, but at last gave up all hopes of finding the owner. That was last winter, she said, the very day I had the first horrid dream about the hearse. I remembered my dream of the previous night, but said nothing. And presently my charcoal was flying over a new canvas, and Tessie stood motionless on the model stand. 3. The day following was a disastrous one for me. While moving a framed canvas from one easel to another, my foot slipped on the polished floor, and I fell heavily on both wrists. They were so badly sprained that it was useless to attempt to hold a brush, and I was obliged to wander about the studio, glaring at unfinished drawings and sketches, until despair seized me, and I sat down to smoke and twiddle my thumbs with rage. The rain blew against the windows and rattled on the roof of the church, driving me into a nervous fit with its interminable patter. Tessie sat sewing by the window, and every now and then raised her head and looked at me with such innocent compassion that I began to feel ashamed of my irritation and looked about for something to occupy me. I had read all the papers and all the books in the library, but for the sake of something to do I went to the bookcases and shoved them open with my elbow. I knew every volume by its color and examined them all, passing slowly around the library, whistling to keep up my spirits. I was turning to go into the dining room when my eye fell upon a book bound in serpent skin, standing in a corner on the top shelf of the last bookcase. I did not remember it, and from the floor could not decipher the pale lettering on the back. So I went to the smoking room and called Tessie. She came in from the studio and climbed up to reach the book. What is it? I asked. The king in yellow. I was dumbfounded. Who had placed it there? How came it in my rooms? I had long ago decided that I should never open that book, and nothing on earth could have persuaded me to buy it. Fearful lest curiosity might tempt me to open it, I had never even looked at it in bookstores. If I ever had had any curiosity to read it, the awful tragedy of young Castigain, whom I knew, prevented me from exploring its wicked pages. I had always refused to listen to any description of it, and indeed nobody ever ventured to discuss the second part aloud, so I had absolutely no knowledge of what those leaves might reveal. I stared at the poisonous model binding as I would at a snake. Don't touch it, Tessie, I said. Come down. Of course, my admonition was not enough, was enough, to arouse her curiosity, and before I could prevent it, she took the book and, laughing, danced off into the studio with it. I called to her, but she slipped away with a tormenting smile at my helpless hands, and I followed her with some impatience. Tessie, I cried, entering the library, listen, I am serious. Put that book away. I do not wish you to open it. The library was empty. I went into both drawing rooms, then into the bedrooms, laundry, kitchen, and finally returned to the library and began a systematic search. She had hidden herself so well that it was half an hour when I discovered her crouching white and silent by the lattice window in the storeroom above. At the first glance I saw she had been punished for her foolishness. The king in yellow lay at her feet, but the book was open at the second part. I looked at Tessie and saw it was too late. She had opened the king in yellow. Then I took her by the hand and led her into the studio, and she seemed dazed, and when I told her to lie down on the sofa, she obeyed me without a word. After a while, she closed her eyes, and her breathing became regular and deep, but I could not determine whether or not she slept. For a long while, I sat silently beside her, but she neither stirred nor spoke. And at last I rose, and, entering the unused storeroom, took the book in my least injured hand. It seemed heavy as lead, but I carried it into the studio again, and sitting down in the rug beside the sofa, opened it and read it through from beginning to end. When faint with excess of my emotions, I dropped the volume and leaned 
wearily back against the sofa. Tessie opened her eyes and looked at me. We had been speaking for some time in a dull, monotonous strain before I realized that we were discussing the king in yellow. Oh, the sin of writing such words, words which are clear as crystal, limpid and musical as bubbling springs, words which sparkle and glow like the poisoned diamonds of the Medicis. Oh, the wickedness, the hopeless damnation of a soul who could fascinate and paralyze human creatures with such words. Words understood by the ignorant and wise alike, words which are more precious than jewels, more soothing than music, more awful than death. We talked on, unmindful of the gathering shadows, and she was begging me to throw away the clasp of black onyx, quaintly inlaid with what we now knew to be the yellow sign. I shall never know why I refused, though, even at this hour here in my bedroom, as I write this confession. I should be glad to know what it was that prevented me from tearing the yellow sign from my breast and casting it into the fire. I am sure I wished to do so, and yet Tessie pleaded with me in vain. Night fell, and the hours dragged on, but still we murmured to each other of the king and the pallid mask. The midnight sounded from the misty spires of the fog-wrapped city. We spoke of Haster and Casilda, while outside the fog rolled against the blank window panes as the cloud waves roll and break on the shores of Pali. The house was very silent now, and not a sound came up from the misty streets. Tessie lay among the cushions, her face a gray blot in the gloom, but her hands were clasped in mine, and I knew that she knew and read my thoughts as I read hers, for we had understood the mystery of the Hyades, and the phantom of truth was vain. Then as we answered each other swiftly, silently, thought on thought, the shadows stirred in the gloom about us, and far in the distant streets we heard a sound. Nearer and nearer it came the dull crunching of wheels, nearer and yet nearer, and now, outside, before the door, it ceased. And I dragged myself to the window and sat. I saw a black plumed hearse. The gate below opened and shut, and I crept shaking to my door and bolted it, but I knew no bolts, no locks could keep that creature out who was coming for the yellow sign. And now I heard him moving very softly along the hall. Now he was at the door, and the bolts rotted at his touch. Now he had entered. With eyes starting from my head, I peered into the darkness, but when he came into the room, I did not see him. It was only when I felt him envelop me in his cold, soft grasp that I cried out and struggled with deadly fury. But my hands were useless, and he tore the onyx clasp from my coat and struck me full in the face. Then, as I fell, I heard Tessie's soft cry, and her spirit fled, and even while falling, I longed to follow her, for I knew that the king in yellow had opened his tattered mantle, and there was only God to cry to now. I could tell more, but I cannot see what help it will be to the world. As for me, I am past human help or hope. As I lie here, writing, careless even whether or not I die before I finish, I can see the doctor gathering up his powders and files, with a vague gesture to the good priest beside me, which I understand. They will be very curious to know the tragedy, they, of the outside world, who write books and print millions of newspapers. But I shall write no more, and the Father Confessor will seal my last words with the seal of sanctity when his holy office is done. They of the outside world may send their creatures into wrecked homes and dead smitten firesides, and their newspapers will batten on blood and tears, but with me their spies must halt before the confessional. They know that Tessie is dead and that I am dying. They know how the people in the house, aroused by an infernal scream, 
rushed into my room and found one living and two dead. But they do not know what I shall tell them now. They do not know what the doctor said as he pointed to a horrible, decomposed heap on the floor, the livid corpse of the watchman from the church. I have no theory, no explanation. That man must have been dead for months. I think I am dying. I wish the priest would. The Damoiselle D.Y.S. Mais ye croy que se sus descendu en pis tenebro on keo de sot hercletus estra verete cache. There be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, for which I know not. The way of an eagle in the air the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. 1. The utter desolation of the scene began to have its effect. I sat down to face the situation and, if possible, recall to mind some landmark which might aid me in extricating myself from my present position. If I could only find the ocean again, all would be clear, for I knew one could see the island of Croy from the cliffs. I laid down my gun, and kneeling beside a rock, lighted a pipe. Then I looked at my watch. It was nearly four o'clock. I might have wandered far from the Kerselik since daybreak. Standing the day before on the cliffs below Kerselik with Golden, Looking out over the somber moors among which I had now lost my way, these downs had appeared to me level as a meadow, stretching to the horizon, and although I knew how deceptive is distance, I could not realize that what from Kerselik seemed to be mere grassy hollows were great valleys covered with gorse and heather, and what looked like scattered boulders were, in reality, enormous cliffs of granite. It's a bad place for a stranger, old Golden said. You'd better take a guide, and I had replied. I shall not lose myself. Now I knew that I had lost myself. As I sat there smoking, with the sea wind blowing in my face, on every side stretched the moorland, covered with flowering gorse and heather and granite boulders. There was not a tree in sight much less a house. After a while I picked up the gun, and turning my back on the sun, tramped on again. There was little use in following any of the brawling streams which every now and then crossed my path, for instead of flowing into the sea they ran inland to reedy pools in the hollows of the moor. I had followed several, but they all led me to swamps or silent little ponds, from which the snipe rose peeping and wheeled away in an ecstasy of fright. I began to feel fatigued, and the gun galled my shoulder in spite of the doubled pads. The sun sank lower and lower, shining level against the yellow gores and the moorland pools. As I walked, my own gigantic shadow led me on, seeming to lengthen at every step. The gore scraped against my leggings, crackled beneath my feet, showering the brown earth with blossoms and the brake bowed and billowed along my path. From tufts of heath rabbits scurried away through the bracken and among the swamp grass, I heard the wild duck's drowsy quack. Once a fox stole across my path, and again as I stooped to drink at a hurrying rill, a heron flapped heavily from the reeds beside me. I turned to look at the sun. It seemed to touch the edges of the plain. When at last I decided that it was useless to go on, and that I must make up my mind to spend at least one night on the moors, I threw myself down, thoroughly fagged out. The evening sunlight slanted warm across my body, but the sea winds began to rise, and I felt a chill strike through me from my wet shooting boots. High overhead gulls were reeling and tossing like bits of white paper, from some distant marsh a solitary curlew called. Light by, little by little, the sun sank into the plain, and the zenith 
flushed with the afterglow. I watched the sky change from palest gold to pink and then to smoldering fire. Clouds of midges danced around me, and high in the calm air a bat dipped and soared. My eyelids began to droop. Then as I shook off the drowsiness, a sudden crash among the bracken roused me. I raised my eyes. A great bird hung quivering in the air above my face. For an instant I stared in capable emotion. Then something leaped past me in the ferns, and the bird rose, wheeled, and pitched headlong to the brake. I was on my feet in an instant, peering through the gorse. There came the sound of a struggle from a bunch of heather close by, and then all was quiet. I stepped forward, my gun poised, but when I came to the heather, the gun fell under my arm again, and I stood motionless in silent astonishment. A dead hare lay on the ground, and on the hare stood a magnificent falcon, one talent buried in the creature's neck, the other planted firmly on its limp flank. But what astonished me was not the mere sight of a falcon sitting on Upon its prey, I had seen that more than once. It was the falcon was fitted with a sort of leash about both talons, and from the leash hung a round bit of metal like a sleigh bell. The bird turned its fierce yellow eyes on me, and then stooped and struck its curved beak into the quarry. At the same instant, hurried steps sounded among the heather, and a girl sprang into the covert, in front. Without a glance at me, she walked up to the falcon and passed her gloved hand under its breast, raised it from the quarry. Then she deftly slipped a small hood over the bird's head and hung it out on her gauntlet, stooped and picked up the hair. She passed a cord about the animal's legs and fastened the end of the thong to her girdle. Then she started to retrace her steps through the covert as she passed me, I raised my cap, and she acknowledged my presence with 